gone nine o'clock. Kia ora koto, no mai, haere mai, ki tēne hui, uh, te kaunihira a uh, whangare, a uh, whangare takua, uh, te rāpari, rua tukau marua, nā hui. Welcome to our meeting on the 22nd of September, the final council meeting for this triennium. Uh, Councillor Murphy is going to open our meeting with Kaukia. Tahia te ara e takutunei. Tuia i runga, tuia i raro, tuia te ngā kautangata. He rungo mau, mauri tu, mauri oho, mauri tau, tihei, mauri ora. Sweep clear the path before us, unite above, unite below. Unite and bind the hearts of all to a commitment of unity, the standing life force, the alert life force, the balanced life force, sneeze the breath of life. Cheryl, um, on behalf of the operator again, we'd like to thank you for everything you
Secondly, we hope that you have found our efforts worthwhile and will continue our assistance into the next government. We are grateful for your uptake of our concerns around housing for older adults and look forward to working into the future with progressing the housing strategy. We are also over the moon that Council has taken on our Silver Festival as an annual event. We know that a lot of our input into developing strategies, plans, etc. across all council departments are absorbed and included in early stages, so we appreciate the opportunities to contribute. We want to recognise the very attentive staff officers who attend our meetings to enable this to happen. A special mention to Nicole Stanton and Claire Wilson. Also, we have found Councillor Cutforth as your representative on our group, a real support. Thank you to Tricia. Today, five councillors and four in the Mayor are retiring. We want to say on behalf of all our older adult populations, a very big thank you for offering to take these leadership roles in caring for and developing our district into a great place to live. Finally, Madam Mayor, you have been a real inspiration for all of Walgaray. You have been inclusive of everyone, generous with your time, and been an outstanding mayor all round. We say goodbye and goodbye to those councillors and wish you lots of well-deserved rest and then lots of adventures and a very happy future. Thank you, everybody. And they, we are going to present you with a heavy Put in your garden so that you remember, in fact, it was a great time being the to present to your meeting today. Today I represent the New Zealand Cadet Forces, in particular the Whangarei Air and the Army Cadets. It's the green one. I have with me today Paula Harris, sitting beside me, and Major Chris Williams, Cadet Forces, uh, now sitting up the front with us. The Cadet Forces <laughs> operates under the wider New Zealand Defence Force umbrella, and we receive support from the New Zealand Defence Force by way of uniforms and policies and, and some training guidance. However, our monetary support is sourced from the local community. So we are a youth organisation that has operated continuously since 1864, with C-Cadets from 18, uh, 1929, sorry, and Air cadets from 1941. They didn't have aircraft in 1864, unfortunately. We provide training to 13 to 19 year olds and have moved on from our initial purpose of pre-training youth to go and join the armed forces to providing leadership skills that will serve our community for decades to come. 
Many of our alumni have gone on to be high, taking on high-ranking roles within the New Zealand Defence Force and other service organisations like Fire and Emergency and the New Zealand Police, both locally and nationally. The back of this document lists many of the names that, uh, of our ex-cadets who have gone on to serve and in some cases in more than one organisation. So beside me today I have Paula Harris, the mother of our most recent New Zealand Defence Force graduate, Georgia Harris. And I'll hand over to Paula. Hello, Koto Katoa. Good morning everyone. I'm Paula Harris and I have a daughter, Georgia. Georgia joined the cadets at the later part of 2013. When she joined, she was extremely shy, introverted, would hide in corners of the rooms on the parade nights. She would also not look up or even acknowledge anyone. However, with the persistence of the officers, she started to change. They encouraged and supported her in her endeavours in the Air Cadet Unit. With their support, she gradually became courageous and even on occasion she would come top of training and weep in the way. Georgia had an ambition to join the New Zealand Air Force for a long time and with the amazing support of the unit officers this dream became a reality and on August the 18th 2022 she had her graduation into her specialty and is now an air craftsman Harris training as a logistical specialist. I believe that all the air cadet unit had a hand in making Georgia the amazing and outgoing woman has she become today and I will always thank them with their time and effort they gave her. Now we're currently based out of the Honorahi Airport in the old fire station. That, that building was purchased by our parents of the full committee back in the late 1980s and it's located on land leased by council. Now I'm going to keep this deliberately open and back. We're now facing the prospect of relocating due to the potential of the rescue helicopter service moving from their current location. Nothing set in stone. So any move that we have in the future will need support from Council. All I ask for at this point is a sympathetic ear if there's a request to Council for support to enable us to keep doing what we do, growing our youth to serve our wider community. That's all I ask. So Your Worship, thank you very much for your unwavering support over the last nine years, especially when I walked in to see you and asked permission to march through your city not long after you started. Thank you very much. We thank, thank you for your service to the Whangarei District and wish you a long and restful retirement. And to all retiring councillors and those up for re-election, we wish you again all the best in your retirement and all the best for the forthcoming elections. Are there any questions you'd like to ask? Councillor Benny. Good job. Now to see you up there, because there's three of those flowers. <laughs> um, it's really good to see some of the names on there, I know it's quite a few of them, and uh, uh, people like Al Simons are really good to see. So you, you say that um, the, uh, I'm just trying to find the, the, the prospect of relocating due to the potential of the rescue helicopter service, is that just what you think will happen, or have you received notes from staff that this will happen? We've been in conversation with um, council staff over this. And, and so if next move to the airport you will have to move or that's highly likely. Okay. Well thank you. Any further questions for clarification? That was a council meetings. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Do you have potential do you have needs in the site that you if you have to move? Um, are there specific things that you need on that site? Uh, nothing that's uh, not relocatable. So there's nothing that's customised and built for us there. Um, David, I appreciate the presentation. I was just going to ask a very simple question, and that is, of all the locations around Whangarei, where is the best location for you guys? Um, somewhere within the, the local Whangarei district would be nice. So if we end up going into rural areas, that's that's not potentially the best option for us. Um, so somewhere central, um, easily accessed by transport and um, with a, a, a place where we can have a decent profile as well. Is the, the following question, so is the airport, the airport at present the best location? 
It's a location, sometimes it's not the best, uh, especially when an aircraft lands whilst we're doing parade. Yes? Any further questions? David, Paul and Chris, thank you so much for bringing uh, your concern to us and I'm sure the future council will, will um, take into account your, your needs um, being parade space, uh, storage of gear, no doubt. Uh, so you know, um, I'm sure our team will work with you to ensure that we can meet those needs in future because your, the work you've done with young people is extraordinary. And uh, George is obviously the evidence of that. So definitely thank you. Thank you for uh, making the time to come to us today in our public forum. Pleasure. Thank you, man. Thank you. Our final uh, speaker in the public forum is Paul Doherty. Paul, welcome to you, Paul. Representing South, same online from all of you and the students.
if you were told that the noise controls you had relied on for many years to protect your home and those people within it are no longer relevant? How would you feel if you were told that the airport next to your home can now make as much noise as it likes? And then on top of that, how would you feel about being exposed to nighttime noise as there is a new operator who will fly throughout the night? This is our situation if you vote for this today. We will have no respite from aircraft noise 24 7, a situation which is entirely unreasonable and for which for some of us will be simply unbearable. The lack of consultation and the lack of assessment of any mechanisms to protect residents, as well as the removal of any protections from noise at the airport, has left our members entirely disillusioned with the Council. Our members feel as though they have been ignored throughout this process, right back from when Council first made its decision to support the relocation of NEST and grant a lease at an extraordinary Council meeting following a private workshop. <clears throat> this is a significant issue for our community. With an election only a few days away, we ask that you listen now to your constituents and act on what we are saying. We implore you to do the right thing and vote against the resolutions in item 6.2 on the agenda today. Now, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Councillors, uh, questions for Paul? Here are no questions. Thank you also to members of Sound for your support for your Scott Houston today. <coughs> brings us to item 5.1, the minutes of our meeting held on Thursday the 25th of August, including the confidential minutes. I have a moment that there are true and correct record. Councillor Peters is moving, Councillor Murphy is seconding. Any corrections or amendments required? If not, I'll put that motion as in favour aye. Aye. Against? Item 5.2, the minutes of our meeting held on the Wednesday, the 24th of August. I have a reader that they are true and correct record of the proceedings at that meeting. Councillor Peters is moving, Councillor Deeming is seconding. Are those any corrections or amendments required? I'll put that motion. Those in favour, aye. 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 Against, carried. For item 5.3, uh, we do need um, to be able to, for us to be able to consider these, these um, matters at today's meeting, because it's our last scheduled meeting for the Triennium. The minutes of our meeting on the 20th, which was Tuesday, uh, need to be approved in this term of council. So hopefully we've got this yes, um, supplementary agenda. So we need a resolution to uh, that council consider item 5.3, the minutes of the exploring meeting for the 20th of September, the second end of the year. Oh, and also item 7.5 to carry the strategic partnership standing committee recommendations yep. at today's meeting. It's been moved by Councillor and a seconded by Councillor Peters. Uh, hopefully you've had a chance to have a look through those minutes and check that they are true and correct record. And yeah, true and correct Are there any uh, amendments required? No amendments, but I just comment that that was a the last meeting of the Cardiac and a significant one. So it's been moved and seconded that uh, we consider those um, minutes. Um, I'll put that motion. Those in favour, aye. Aye. Against, <coughs> carried. And now we will have the resolution that they are a true and correct record. I apologise for the confusion. Carolyn, our Carolyn here, is <laughs> on fine form. So okay, let's do, look at item 5.3, the minutes of a uh, meeting held on Tuesday the 20th of September. And can somebody move that, that they are a true and correct record? Councillor yeah. Cooper and Councillor Cooper are seconding. Any corrections required? Um, Councillor Cooper wasn't there. Part of the meeting, wasn't it? My, my no, this is item 5.3, the extraordinary council meeting for Tuesday the 20th of September. Uh, Councillor Cooper was, was in attendance. No, it wasn't. I think it was an apology. It was an apology. Oh, 
Yes, for the sake of moving on, Your Worship, I'm happy to. So, Councillor Coparillo is happy to move that, and Councillor Cutler is a seconder. Thank you. Um, normally, we have not in attendance um, about everything, so you're absolutely right. Uh, any other corrections required for those minutes? I'll put that motion those in favour. Aye. 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 Against? Carried. Item 6.1, the Family District Council Communication Strategy, page 24 of our agenda. Uh, the recommendation is that the Council adopt the Family District Council Communication Strategy 2225. Councillor Clark is moving that motion, and Councillor Peters is seconding. Councillor Clark. Thank you. Um, communications is one of the things I stood up for when I uh, came into Council. We've moved a long way since then we've had so much extra involvement but it's also clear that today we have a contingent of people who have not been communicated to clearly. Um, being bombarded by so many advertisements everywhere, engagement is imperative that we get it right. Um, I pay full kudos to the social media team who have gone out of their way to do so many different ways to engage with people and to catch their attention, um, especially for Craig putting himself into the position of, of making the fool of himself, but always worthwhile. The abilities that we have to go out to the public is vast, but even sending direct letters to people's houses does not always actually engage people. So even though we try to engage and get people to communicate back with us, sometimes when busy lives happen, we don't actually get a chance to do so. One of the big things that we constantly hear that makes things difficult for people is the jargon and the different types of political speak that we have to deal with and ensuring that we try to get out to the public with clear, concise, understandable <coughs> words that are actually able to be in absorbed and taken on whilst also providing an explanation in the political sense of it um, is imperative that we do this. Um, the strategy going forward is improvement. We do need to have uh, more work on this. Um, but that is a thing about communication, it's, it's making sure we are improving as we go. Whilst this is an external communication strategy, um, the internal communication strategy is also vital also. So whilst it's not in this, it's one of those things that we also need to improve, but I'll leave it at that. Okay, that's what it is. Uh, thank you, Worship. I'd just like to pick up really on what Councillor uh, Connor has said about engagement and uh, I've found, and going back to the uh, key actions, uh, one thing that I have really appreciated towards the end of this term has been uh, more of an alignment in terms of working groups uh, with uh, various interests in the community. I feel Often uh, we stand at a distance uh, in the chamber uh, and I feel that uh, when we engage with uh, groups on a working basis, uh, it gives both parties a really good understanding of the issues involved. Uh, and we will consider an item later on in terms of uh, cardio and, and really uh, the ability to have sat down uh, with Hapu and being able to discuss uh, detailed issues in a very relaxed and informative way, I feel has added a lot of value. So although we have a communication strategy and we have policy on that, I think the actions of a council to be able to sit down in a working capacity, understand the issues, is very much at the forefront as well, in my opinion. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor Yeah, Madam Chair, look, 
Um, I'm, look, I'm happy with the way that the communication strategy has been developed. I'm happy with the things. There are things where, and I, I don't think any one of us can argue and say that communication is always changing, and or it isn't always changing, and, we're, and the fact that we can't argue with the fact that we don't always get it right. One of the things I would love to see in the communication strategy is actually dealing with multi-ethnics. We don't seem to communicate very well with those from other cultures. We don't seem to communicate with those who um, use English as their second language. So that to me is where an area where I feel the communication strategy is lacking and needs to be bringing back into line. And that's where we can do improvement because as we have a multicultural society in Whangarei. We are not bicultural, we are multicultural. And we need to consider all people who are part of our district, not just one. Um, yeah, thank you, Jane, for bringing <coughs> this to us and, and refreshing it. Um, to be honest, though, there's, there's not much new in there, and I think we knew most of what was, was going on. Uh, I, when, when I first came on to council, I, I was not, not critical, but uh, concerned that we don't tell enough good stories. And the classic one is uh, yesterday or the day before, there was a, an article about uh, the rates, the, the Fuller Eight district rates, how we're one of the best in the country, one of the lowest rates in the country. We haven't told that story, we haven't repeated that, and I think those are the sorts of things we need to get out there. We also need to be mindful that the bad stories need to be out there as well. And, um, and, and understanding of things like Three Waters, and I really appreciate what you guys did for making the, the Three Waters um, situation clear in regard to better funding. I thought that was really well done, but I think we can take that further again and, and really expand on that because there's real concern for Three Waters out there. Not a lot of people know about it. We've spent tens and probably a hundred hours going through the, the Three Waters situation and understand, making the people out there, under, giving them an understanding of it is really important. And those sorts of things I would like to see more. Um, but really like some of the stuff in there, like including elected members in some of the stories, I, I think that's a, a, a vital way to get our story across. But I really think we need to be way more proactive, um, you know, in particular the rates. The rates are a good story. I looked at the website this morning on the Facebook page and there's nothing on there. And that's something we should be celebrating. Um, I agree that this, thank you, this is a good strategy. Um, I'm hoping in the next iteration of council that we take consideration of the, uh, of the groupings of community meetings uh, that happen in Whanganei and that we send representatives to those meetings. Um, particularly, I note that the networkers always conflicts with a council meeting and uh, although our, our workers attend, they always have to rush off. And I, I often um, have to decide between a council meeting and con connecting with the community. So thank you. Just a consideration to put in. Thank you, I just want to acknowledge the work that's been done over the last few years. Um, by the team that's in the council now, and I think you can see, if you've been here for a little while, which I hope you have, you can see the, um, the changes that have happened, and particularly I want to pick up on what Councillor Connor was saying, which is the social media work, and um, the great work, and the very, um, very sort of human aspect that's been used in terms of responding, and also um, the way uh, there is some pushback on some of the really negative comments that come through on Facebook. There is a, not, not a, it's just a, a, a good response, a really considered response that tries to put things in context. So I think the social media group is really working really, really well. Um, well done on the, the website, which was clunky in the extreme for many, many years, and it's really good to see that changing. And I, I, I do think with the um, rates notices, um, that there's quite a lot more thinking we could do, and because that is a traditional, me you know, the posted letter is a traditional media form which will get to people who don't use social media, particularly older people, not just older, older people. And I think the information we can put in the rates demands and the way we present that information, so it's not just oh, it's another thing from council throw it out. It's actually done in a really interesting way. Is something that that we can do some more work on. But I really appreciate the work that's been done over the last few years and um, best of luck for the future.
Pastor Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Yes, it's good to see the development of this strategy, and uh, I like the page, but on page 36, where he's got a bit about elected members. Um, it's, I've been around this table for a number of terms, and uh, we can come under the threat of being an invisible lot. It's uh, quite concerning to councillors, and we've probably had an example this morning already where elected members should be fronting meetings and uh, be in place to hold those meetings. Just want to go back a bit, you know, like um, there's a role for us to play, but there's also a role for the media, out, the outside media to play. And I'm really frustrated. Like, we used to have five reporters at council meetings. Five. And the young guys who front TV1 knew that TV3, Ryan Boswell and Michael Mora, they actually cut their teeth coming in here and listen to us councillors. And so then we had the Wongaro report, the Wongaro leader, and the advocate. And why I bring that up is it's good to get an outside view of us. This is our strategy, but it's good to get outside people viewing us and, and our rate payers out there realising that council's saying this, but it's being scrutinised by an outside media. And I think that's very, very valuable. I think that keeps us on our toes. But, and uh, I totally agree that um, public media, the politicians have got a major role to play in it, and we should be fronting media. You know, Councillor Deeming and I are in the Green Bay area, when we were setting up the um, Wall of Port and all that stuff, the amount of meetings we went to is quite phenomenal, phenomenal but everyone expected us to lead those meetings. And uh, uh, so it's good to see it in here. So I'm um, looking for the next council, it should be really good. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hobbs. Councillor Martin. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for the report. Um, with communication, it needs to be a two way thing. And never before have we had so many means of communication and our public is so poorly informed. We had a meeting last night, probably 140, 50 people there, and the questions they were asking were basic things that we, they, they should have already been able to find some. And so that's why I believe that we need to um, get more feedback. We're the conduit between the people and the chamber, and, and we need to, to improve on that. But I think this is a step forward and it's a work in progress and the work you have done has been really good. So good luck with carrying on with it and we'll see how it goes. Thank you. Any further discussion? Councillors, I would just like to add uh, my thanks to the team for this, this strategy and in particular from a comms perspective, the two pages that near the very end, the roadmap. So uh, you note we've got the, the various channels, email, social media and websites, traditional media, elected members, written communication, my language plan and engagement. And for each of those channels you have a roadmap and, and some actions and a plan for them. So uh, that in itself, and it's really clear and easy to follow, uh, so yeah, kudos to you. And it's in plain English. Hurrah! <laughs> um, and that's always the test, isn't it? That um, what is the 13 year old is able to read it and comprehend, uh, you know, you've got a good document. So, from a communication strategy, well done to the team. Thank you. That's a comment. Um, once again, thank you very much. A couple of things I actually forgot in my um, first points was oh, big kudos for the effort that we actually have going outside of office hours these days where the communications through the social media are actually engaging at a time when people are commenting after work in the middle of the night and <coughs> big kudos to that for going into those type of things. We have live streaming as well these days which is another form of communication which allows people to see our meetings whilst they may be boring sometimes uh, <laughs> when they want to be able to or, or come back to them. Um, it also holds us to account because our voices, our comments are actually out there and there so that people can actually utilize them. It's a double-edged sword, but it's one of those things that it's, um, it's good to have. Um, and the other fantastic thing is the fact that we can now sign up to emails to get consultations emailed to us when we actually have that information. So whilst what we are bombarded, bombarded, bombarded advertisements, we can actually get an email to us when something actually is coming out for our input. And I highly encourage people to actually input in that so we all hear your voices because one person isn't going to be able to do anything, but all of us will be able to hopefully make some good judgment calls. But that's another way to be able to use your voice to tell us what to do. I think. Thank you, Councillor. The right of replies. We're going to put that motion. Those in favour, aye. 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 Against? Carried. Okay,
Thank you, Your Worship. If I've got a second. Yes. Councillor Rick. Do you want me to read the recommendation now? I think it's important, oh. yes. We love to hear your voice. <laughs> well, this might take a bit of time. Okay, so the recommendation that Council 1 agree, having considered the 7th of September 2022 recommendation by the Airport Noise Management Committee to adopt <coughs> A. The No Northern Emergency Services Trust Nest training flights occurred at Anarahi Airport. In the event that nest operations are relocated to the airport. B. The council takes an advocacy right position related to the centralised coordination of flights. C. The council has entered into a standalone agreement with nest covering the commitment it has made to reduce noise. This would include, but not limited to, one, removing all training flights from Anarahi Airport. Two, complying with noise abatement procedures wherever practical. Three, complying with any approved airport noise management plan, including requirements for maintenance and testing wherever practicable. Any agreement would need to be cons consistent, comply with relevant legislation and council policies, including the district plan and designations. D, the council works with the airport noise management committee to update the airport noise management plan with changes to be considered, including one, updating the plan to include NIS draft noise abatement procedures. Two, updating monitoring and reporting requirements, that is, using flight path tracking technologies to identify and clarify the reason for breaches. Three, technical review of airport operators, operators including NEST and Marshall Day. Four, updates to policies, systems and procedures including the 2009 plan. E, the council takes an efficacy role in the time of investment in, in the new airport and note that this would not be a decision for council or this. If the council works with the airport noise management Com committee to develop a communication plan and or education program and the council's further resolves. Two, that for the, avoid for the avoidance of doubt, training commitments identified under resolution one a to F relate to flight training based at the airport. House <coughs> line and attachment three. While this flight training would, would not occur at the airport, should NEST relocate to that, to that location, it is noted that flight would still be required to transit to and from any off-site training, <coughs> training locations. Three. Note that NEST and the airport will look at mechanisms to communicate flight training undertaken prior to any relocation, aligned needs with any communication plan de developed under 1.1F. Four, note the recommendation not supported by the Airport Noise Management Committee along with the supporting information and, and analysis. Five, just a, I'm going to add two words in here. Confirm council support in principle for the relocation of NES from Kensington Park to Longgrave District Airport. Six, authorise staff to undertake negotiation with NEST for the new lease at Bombay District Airport with a short term extension to the existing lease at Kensington. Seven, authorise the Chief Executive to finalise and execute leases with NEST at Bombay District Airport and Kensington, along with any standalone agreement with NEST covering the commitment to reduce noise. Councillor just before we go on, uh, Councillor Reid, uh, the, those two words in principle were added. Um, and number five, to, yes, please. So you're happy with a seconder to include those? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Holt. Okay, to speak, to speak to the motion. As we know, the Council made a decision in November to look at relocating this to the Anurahi Airport. Nothing has, has been finalised since that date. It's a work in progress and uh, we set up an airport board's management committee to look at mitigating effects. How can we mitigate the effects of noise to the residents out there and to the general public? 
we're very much following the procedures and, and uh, the advice given by Marshall Data, the specialist noise monitoring company who specialises in this work. So we've still got work to do. But part of the mitigating effects is in our subcommittee meeting is we've looked at the um, possibility of putting in double-day window, windows. We've looked at uh, other noise management things. Most important at the moment, we have not got a specific site exactly where the buildings will be or where the, the flight path will be at the airport. That is yet to be determined. So when you look at the mitigating effects, the airport's been there for some time and, and the, it has been used by helicopters in the past. And uh, we, we're looking at the use of the, the runway. Is it better for them to taxi in or hover in? And it's, that has a major effect of noise. That work is ongoing. And what we're suggesting here is we need to continue that work. We need to finalise. Although we've got a lot of residents from Manorai community in here today, objecting to what we're doing, we take an oath to represent all ratepayers and residents of Mongrel District. And in a large percentage are actually looking at it close, closely and say we need to protect the emergency rescue choppers to be in the air at all times to safeguard our public. And we've got a pretty good service here in Northland. Mm -hmm. So so there's a lot of um, lot of background work being done. It's not, it's not finalised yet. We've offered um, as much help we can to mitigate effects to the residents. We've, we're working, we've got a good uh, subcommittee working through the process. And, uh, you know, it's been reported this morning that we've now got a, a, a court action. And uh, my comment to that is, you know, under judicial review, it's my understanding is they can only follow, only go back to due process and follow the due process we we'll follow. Uh, so it would be interesting to see what comes of that, but I'm quite comfortable where we are as a council. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hobbs. Councillor, before I open to debate, I would just like to um, make a, a, a number of points. We as a council have set up the Airport Noise Management Committee. You will recall in uh, the minutes of our meeting uh, back in, we adopted the minutes today from our meeting held on the 25th of August, that one of the items that we do to continue business over the, uh, the election period is to uh, hold membership from some of the committees. The uh, Airport Noise Management Committee was one of those committees where the people who have been uh, elected or uh, appointed both by council and from the community continue along. The councillors obviously don't, um, but the, that committee remains. It's a really important point to note that, that we have ensured that, um, that that committee is not discharged after the, uh, the elections. The terms of reference for the Airport Noise Management Committee gives them the, the power to, to make recommendations to council. The Airport committee, Noise Management Committee has made recommendations to council and we today have the ability to either adopt them or not. We do have that option. I think uh, in, in reference to that committee, there, there was a very robust uh, process where the uh, committee reviewed the recommendations. Some were accepted by the committee, some were not. The ones that were adopted at the, uh, the committee, at the meeting, to recommend to council were the ones that have been included in the recommendation today. So those recommendations are um, one through, it's actually um, item one, with A, B, C, D, E, E and F. So we today are looking at adopting the recommendations from that committee which has external representation on it, including members of the community. The other points I wanted to, to make, uh, this is uh, clearly not a decision to relocate the Emergency Services Trust to Onorahi. It is to progress, as Councillor Holtz has said, the, the steps that we have been taking, we agreed in principle in November last year for the relocation. We uh, have then looked at and taken into account the concerns from our community. There have been numerous public meetings which we attended. And the setting up of this committee, I seem to recall Councillor Cockerell was the, the um, elected member who put that in as a, as a, um, a motion that was passed by this council. 
So we've also, in the, uh, the resolution, the motion today, uh, making it very, very clear from the staff perspective, um, items two, three, four, five, six, and seven are staff recommendations to for the avoidance of doubt, of doubt for some of those measures. Included in the agenda today are uh, appendices, and one of them is around the mitigation of noise associated with NRHL training at Honorary Airfield. This is on page 78 of the agenda, and on page 80, the briefing paper, the base site consideration and selection, which was information that also came to the Airport Noise Management Committee. So we do take this seriously. We have listened, and we are taking the next step toward incorporating some of these um, recommendations into a potential lease for the site at Honorary. Uh, and I'm very happy to be supporting the recommendations, uh, the motion as it is today. So, Mr. Bay, Council Bay Lightning, you have your. Oh, thanks, Mike. Thank you. I'll stand up. Um, with all due respect, um, I don't feel that um, Honorahi have been listened to. Um, I think there has been, uh, for me, there has been a lack of information. Um, there's been a lack of consultation and there's been a lack of assessment. Um, there's lots of things in here that um, I, in principle, agree with, but um, there's a couple of things I just want to bring up. Um, I, I feel that this decision has got to be, and I, and I, and I know it seems to be, um, made with the three of us parties, the council, NEST, and the people of Onorahi, and I do not believe that that's, that has been done. Um, it says here, um, through through NEST, I know that they're doing their, their um, what, what they've got to do, but for us as a council to make the decision, and, and we don't have access to any of their um, notes, um, I don't feel that that's very transparent for me to be able to make a clear decision. Um, it says here, if NEST is to relocate to the airport, communication with the Honorary community will also be critical. For me, that's too late, and I think for them, that is way too late. Um, I pride myself on listening, and I haven't listened to you, and for that, I apologise. Um, and I would like to really encourage my fellow councillors on our last day of term that the fourth option really be considered. Um, that we take an active role in looking for an alternative site. And I don't believe that we have done that. Um, so I just want to say that um, I know that there's a few of us here that, that are listening to you now, um, and I would really encourage my fellow councillors just to, just to sort of think about what we are actually doing. Um, some of us, I feel like, for myself, I think initially I sort of felt like, oh, well, it's sort of that not in my backyard sort of thing. But, you know, this isn't in my backyard. This is in their backyard. And um, they haven't been listened to. So um, I would just like to encourage you all, especially um, the UA Cover Board councillors, to support them. Thank you. that you may applause, but you do it with the deaf. So, thank you very much. Council people. A couple of uh, questions, Your Worship. Uh, with the changing of the words in point number five, page 43, uh, to now read, the council confirm council support in principle for the relocation of Nest Kensington Park to Whangarei District Airport. Does that mean, and then when you read point seven, Authorise the Chief Executive to finalise and execute lease with NEST at Whangarei District Airport and Kensington, along with any standalone agreement with NEST covering the commitments to reduce noise. Does that mean we are placing the Chief Executive in a position where he is going to make this decision on behalf of Council? Yes, Simon, do you want to respond to that? Um, that would probably would need some, uh, some legal advice to answer that question in front. <laughs> Through the chair has read that the, the resolution does put the delegation with the chief executive to finalise the change. <coughs> sorry, 
as stated, um, continues Council's position of support and principle and continues the process, but the delegation and the resolution is with the Chief Executive. So thank you. May I speak to that, please, Your Worship? Um, the NEST, uh, and no one would disagree, is an absolutely vital service of which I have benefited personally. And it has to be kept in the air and it has to be kept operating for the benefit of Northland and I absolutely uh, applaud those people who are involved in it. Thank you very much. Uh, as Councillor Hulse has pointed out, it is important that it's kept in the air and point six, as I read it, allows for the existing lease at Kensington to be extended for a period of time. But I am not comfortable with us as elected members passing the responsibility on to the Chief Executive. I don't think it's fair on him and I don't think it's fair on the community. Uh, I believe that we have time to work this through. We've been informed this morning that there is legal action coming and so I won't be supporting this motion. I've been absent for some of this debate and the reason is that my husband had a major stroke, really major, life-threatening, and um, we took him to Whangarei Hospital and he was transferred to Auckland Hospital by helicopter. Um, Emphasising the word transfer because there's a lot of publicity about transfer as being non-urgent. I'm on the District Health Board and I've checked with them and with the um, people on the ground that I talk to as part of this experience and they say that no transfer by helicopter is non-urgent. No, they wouldn't because it costs a lot of money. So when we were, he and I, Tim and I were coming back from Auckland to Whangarei, we were transferred by ambulance because it was no longer, he survived and it was no longer urgent. So that's something I really want to clear up. Um, so obviously, for me, I have a personal and emotive support for NEST and I realise their flight path goes over my house when they go to Dargaville and every time it goes over, I go out and I say a prayer for whoever they're picking up, whether that is a small child that needs to go to Auckland Hospital, Starship, or whether it's someone on a farm underneath a tractor. You know, it's so important. However, I do think in our process, we, you know, just going back to Councillor Cooper's, uh, sorry, Connor, Connor, Councillor Connor's um, talk about communication that we have not been rigorous enough in our consultation. So I think that we do need to actually, um, so I'm not going to be supporting this despite the fact that I so passionately support the NEST helicopter. So I think we should be doing more um, consultation on this, a wide consultation. Um, this is a big issue. Let's consult fully. Uh, and also we need, as Councillor Go Lightly said, <laughs> um, we need to make public um, the the work that has gone into uh, that's gone into looking at alternatives. So those are my two points. Thank you. This is a this is a really difficult debate, and I won't I won't speak to the to the um, visitors who are here today because I know we are meant to address council. I find it I find it really hard because I have a huge amount of sympathy for the local community. Um, 
We are, if, if we support Councillor Holtz's motion, we're supporting um, the move in principle. But in reality, um, I, like Councillor Peters, um, am a huge supporter of the important work that they do. And I, I have never been, I, I or anyone I know have never had to be a, a passenger on one of the Nest helicopters, and I touch wood, I hope we never have to be. But I think the work they do is critical. And to be pragmatic, we have looked at all the other sites that are available. And I think, as difficult as it is, I believe that Onorahi Airport is the best location for Ness to relocate to. And I'm really sorry, um, you know, that the, the residents who live around the airport will have to deal with, if it goes ahead, um, deal with this change. It will be difficult. Um, in Nongadu, we lived in our own little magical wonderland until a daycare centre was developed at the end of our driveway. And going through that change was one of the hardest processes that I had to live through because it completely changed our lifestyle. We weren't listening, that's right, we, we, we don't have to listen to helicopters, um, but we do have a lot of traffic coming in and out constantly, which is also, you know, impacted on our lives and my children's lives. My point is that change is hard, but as Councillor Hull said, when you are elected to, on behalf to represent the best thing for your whole community and the whole district, sometimes you do have to make really um, <coughs> difficult but pragmatic decisions. And, and I know that we have, you know, there have been investigations into alternative sites. The Onorahi site is the only central suitable location. Um, and so with that I just want to say I acknowledge and I apologise to the community for what they're going through. I know this is really hard. Um, but I'm going to be voting to support the uh, recommendation today. Thank you. There's a couple of questions and the questions relate to the, uh, the agenda item the way it's written. Um, I understand in discussions there was um, commitments that were being made by NEST that if they were to come to go to the airport there were going to be additional things added, but yet I'm not seeing any of that actually included in the item. Do they need to be spelt out now or do they need to actually be spelt out in the item as well? Because it, it, I would hate to see that if this was to proceed that those things then don't, aren't included. So through the chair, um, there have been extensive discussions through the Airport Laws Management Committee, which NEST were involved in alongside experts and community representatives, airport representatives and councillors. Through that process, we worked through a number of different options, practical options to make that noise if NEST was relocated. And the recommendations you have in front of me are those that came from the committee itself. So recommendation C in particular, um, removing all training from and it's all flight training, which is clarified for the from Monarahi Airport, compliance with the noise abatement procedures wherever practicable, compliance with the approved airport noise management plan, including compliance for maintenance and testing wherever practicable. Alongside that, there's also a recommendation to enter into a binding agreement with NEST around those things. That effectively recognises the fact that through a lease, council could only control, sorry, the airport could only control those things that happen on the ground, and getting those commitments locked into a standalone agreement is the intent, so that least up to do those. So those are the recommendations you have in front of you. Madam Chair, the reason I'm asking is I remember there being a discussion that was quite clearly offered that there would also be an emergency <coughs> vehicle being added to uh, the airport if this was to happen. So if this, since it's not written here, there's no guarantee of it actually happening. Do you recall that? So through Chair, I, I don't recall a specific commitment to an emergency vehicle. It may or may not happen, I simply can't recall at this point. Um, but these are the provisions around noise mitigation. So there may be other discussions that we have with NES, and there may be other things that Council wishes to see. Um, we'll take your direction on that, but these are the noise. Uh, the, the recommendations from the Lords Management Committee rather than any other operational requirements. Um, we're just going on something that Councillor Murphy, um, I think it was Councillor Murphy, if 
we don't adopt these recommendations today, Ness going to have to stop flying. Through the Chair, I can't speak on behalf of NEST. Um, there, there have been some comments around potential impacts, but that is a question we'd have to ask her if we in terms of the impact. Um, the one thing I would say which is covered in the agenda is obviously NEST are operating out of Kensington at the moment. Um, if uh, there is no decision or direction and no continuation of negotiations, then better in the interim, um, operations would like to be in Kensington. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, a, a question uh, through you, Your Worship. Uh, Don, um, uh, Paul Doherty, uh, in his address earlier on, uh, mentioned uh, that uh, would not be subject to noise limits. Uh, and uh, uh, my understanding is that uh, there, there are limits there, and I'd just be interested in your response on that whether I've got a uh, misunderstanding on that, uh, that, that's the first point. So uh, certainly I won't stray into uh, any proceedings in this council and, and to be honest, haven't had time to review those. So appreciate that those have been received by council um, and they'll be working through in due course. Um, just taking a step back, however, two things in place. So there are airport noise control boundaries um, and there, within that is a 55 decibel limit and a 65 decibel outer control limit. There is, and there, there has been throughout different iterations of the district plan an exemption for, um, and it's been worded in different ways, and I won't go through that, um, but <coughs> an exemption for emergency helicopter movements over, over time. What we've tried to do alongside the Airport Noise Management Committee is work through what the impacts of um, next relocating could be on the boundaries, even though there is an exemption and they're not, um, it'll be disputed that they're not required to um, comply. You have within the document and previous documents that you've been provided um, ex um, examples of those contours as, as mapped. Um, and there are small features around some of the perimeters of the 55 decibel out of control boundary as a result of that relocation, even though there is an exemption in place, which again will be subject to a process. Thank you. Uh, a further question. Uh, so we, when we're looking at, at the um, what we have in front of us that relates to the designation of, of the airport, uh, and the, it's the immediacy of NEST operating out of the airport. It's not establishing a headquarters at the airport in terms of uh, other ambulances uh, and a, a, I suppose a strong administration centre there. So, through Chair, um, the, the what you have is, is a, I mean, essentially a substantive proposal from NEST, which they've asked for your support in principle back in November to relocate their, their flight operations. Um, there are other sort of staff and training requirements that they may have, but the indication and uh, that they worked through with you previously is not to let the effects and job alongside that, for example. Uh, thank you. If I could um, now uh, comment. Uh, I've always seen procrastination as the Achilles heel of local government. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, what we tend to do is we tend to uh, push matters out uh, that are difficult to make decisions on. Uh, I, I listen to Councillor Holt and I look at the uh, alteration in the recommendation there in principle. Uh, I listen to and I've read about the mitigation of effects. Part of that relates to training and limiting, <coughs> limiting training. Uh, I'm also mindful that uh, on the previous item we talked about communication. And, and, uh, and on communication, uh, I was strong uh, in my comments in relation to a working party situation. Uh, I find that the Airport Noise Management Committee is really that. 
Uh, it's a committee that has been involved. It uh, involves uh, the local community. And it's one that I would see that uh, an ongoing uh, discussion that that community would, that committee would have for the community on mitigation is really important. Uh, so uh, I've come to the conclusion after reading uh, through this, and I must, I've had, because uh, I'm a representative of the Bomberi Heads Ward, uh, I've had a number of phone calls to me uh, over, over this. We're elected to make decisions, and I feel that the motion that we have in front of us, uh, to me, I have a level of comfort with. I have comfort in it that it's in principle, uh, and I think that uh, further information has to be forthcoming. Uh, Councillor Holtz is the chair of um, uh, that committee. Uh, and I, I would hope that in the end, uh, a decision will be made with all the information that's required. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, we had before us what I term a live document, which is what the helicopter hopes to achieve in its, its task as having live occupants. So often they aren't that fortunate. <coughs> Every term there's a political football, and this one is a doozy. And I, I live in the flight path, and I'm quite happy with that. I chose to live there. The helicopter was going before I walked. I feel sorry for the residents of Anarahi and the whole of Whanarei, particularly the ones that surround the, the hospital, because Man, do they pop it there. I see it, I hear it, people tell me of it, and not one of them has ever said to me, I wish it would go away. So I think we're taking a rather short sight of view in some ways, and if what I say shortly costs me this chair at this election, so be it. I don't want it. The people in that helicopter need that helicopter, they need us. We support it, we fundraise, we help keep it in the air. But it does need to come back to earth to get some lifeblood so that it can get back in the air. And I, I am going to fully support this. It is a live document, it is not written in stone. So we have some regular room to make this work. So I will be supporting Councillor Holse's recommendation 100%. And I hope the rest of our council do. Thank you. I first want to acknowledge all the people that have turned up today to support the speaker that from this morning's conversation and who do feel that they are to be interrupted by the service. I also want to acknowledge all those people who have commented through the posts that have been on Facebook that have been completely supportive of the move of NEST to the Marai Airport. This is one of those situations where it highlights where people have a passion or whatnot, where they're putting their effort in, outweighs maybe one of the other people actually doing things where if you do support these types of situations, you need to engage to make sure your voice is heard. At one of the um, engagements that the council held to get the noise committee standing, there was one person who turned up to support the move to the airport. She happened to be a nurse at the hospital, directly impacted, directly underneath, and she had wholehearted support for the move. I live next to the airport. I live under the helicopter flight path currently in a valley, so it's directed to me as well. And there are people outside the airport who also support this, live directly outside the airport currently, who support this. 
acknowledging also those that do not support this. I have a friend who has a baby who is only a month younger than my son. They've had so many struggles with actually the living situation of their child that they've had to go on this whole helicopter so many times down that they've got an appreciation for each one of the helicopters that's there and wholehearted support for them. And it also brings back my, my appreciation of how, how lucky I am. <coughs> I really appreciate the people that come out to support this today. Um, from the stand, uh, against this, this version. Um, I'm still comfortable with the position of supporting this and it has to go on to on that IP in support of those who have been local online that I have seen. And I have tried to deal with any inappropriate language as much as I possibly can with horrible comments because I do know that the people that are here also support the gas helicopter just in a different form. <coughs> Councillor Cooper brought up a, a question before, and I just want to clarify if I could, please. So, all of the top above to number five talks about the, the noise mitigation. Five talks about confirming in principle to say it's there's still an op still an option available for it if, if something else comes up. So, it's in principle, we agree with the location. Six and seven basically delegate straight away authority to start negotiations. Does that mitigate what five is? I don't think mitigate is the correct term. Um, um, counter. Counteract or, or none, none of five? No. So through the chair again, um, the, I think it's, it's worth linking back to recommendation one. Um, and that, if approved by council, as a result of the Airport Noise Management Committee's recommendations, will provide some pretty clear parameters for the chief executive in the negotiation. Um, but again, the same answer as I gave to um, Councillor Cooper: um, the delegation does go to the chief executive based on the moving on these resolutions. These things. There's also the possibility that Ness may not agree to this as well, isn't is there, is there, or is there not? Uh, through the chair, yes, this would be subject to approval from the Ness board, um, and I guess if you as a council had adopted the, and not wherever you go with them, but if you've adopted the recommendations of the Airport Noise Management Committee, that does set some pretty clear parameters for the chief executive in the negotiation. Question, Councillor Yes, thank you. Um, if, with the fourth option that we've got here, what would that entail going forward? Fourth option. So, through Chair, you're talking about the fourth option under yeah. the recommendations not to support? Under the fourth option, yeah, that's right. So I guess. Sorry, um, can you be? I'm not. It can be what which option we 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 look at. Oh, the bottom of page forty-five. Thank you. Yeah. While while the fourth option could be for council to take an extra role in finding an alternative site. So what going forward? What would that entail? So I guess the fundamental question is does. So to be clear, um, there, are, there are three options for council around site location, one of which is to not support the operation of NEST at either site, leaving it to NEST to find an alternative. Um, the fourth option, which we didn't put as an option that's not included as something the council could consider, would be for council to take an active role in finding a site for NEST. Um, as I stated in the agenda, um, NEST is a standalone charity and trust. Um, Strictly, is not council's responsibility to find a site for NEST. Um, so, so it would be a bit involved council stepping into that space. Um, I don't know what the process would look like beyond that. And then, secondly, um, just noting um, you've already got inflation at, at a summary level on the sites that NEST is already considered. So, 
So their feedback is they've done the investigation, obviously we weren't a lead in that and we weren't involved in the detailed investigation, but they have provided a summary which you consider alongside that option board. Thank you, Worship. Just uh, listen to some of the debate. It's, uh, it's an unusual situation. In the Over as the council, you get to uh, go to a lot of meetings about the controversial issues, and uh, just want to wind the clock back under the last term of council, where we had public meeting after public meetings, where with uh, landowners in South Long Row were talked about having a four-lane highway going across through their property, and that is going to be imposed on. Them. In this case, we're actually trying to. To mitigate the effects that they're done right here by shifting the rescue helicopters to to Unrahi. We're trying to mitigate, we're doing all we can to work with the community. So we've been very, very careful to make sure that council laws have been fully informed. Uh, we had a, a when it first came up, we had a workshop at council, and then we set up the airport noise management committee that we extended that out, and we've got uh, community representation on that, and we'll we all even extended that to an extra person, so we've got five community. Representative, plus we've got representative from the users of, of the airport as well. So we moved from meeting to a workshop where we could fully discuss openly and honestly about all the concerns we had next in the room. So we, everyone can ask the questions, then we go to a meeting. So our process has been quite thorough. And um, what comes out of that is everyone's got a base understanding that the helicopters have got to go somewhere. And so we're trying to make it as, as smooth as possible to look at data raise the workable space. But one thing that hadn't come up in any discussion here is the cost of relocation. That is not our cost, it's cost on this. And we as ratepayers here, we all pay a contribution to the Northern Regional Council targeted rate to fund the rescue helicopters. So all residents in Northern fund us. All residents would therefore be looking at us as councillors and leaders trying to make a decision about this. And so what I'm trying to convey to you all here that, that uh, we need to make a decision without a motion. We've got to take a motion out of this. This is about, is it important enough to relocate the this operation to the airport? That is basically the question. And so if you take the emotion out of it, you know, as an example I've just used, many times council imposes things on residents. This one, we're trying our best. That is why the slight amendment in, in number five here that we supported in principle, because we've, as I mentioned before, the work is still progressing on this. We're doing, we're endeavouring to, to bring all the information together, and that working party can scrutinise any part of, of what we're doing. So I'd just like to thank our staff for being uh, for supplying all the information on time to anyone who's requested, and that's been really, really helpful. So, and you wish it. I know you could have dodged this one on your agenda today, but good on you for having it here. It's got to be dealt with. And uh, you know, part of the recommendation is we've got to extend the lease at Kensington Park if you have to allow the nest seat to service. But we'd be totally irresponsible for council if we do not do that. So thanks very much. Thank you, Councillor Knox. The right of reply is being made. Division. Thank you, Councillor Deeming has called for a division. Those in favour, please raise your hands. Councillors Cutforth. Deeming, Cockerillo, Benny, Martin, Pulse, Reed, Murphy, Connor, Innes, and Her Worship the Mayor is against. Councillors Go Lightly, Cooper, and Peters. Ms. Kerry. Brings us to item uh, 6.3, the temporary road closure for the Monday Christmas Road. Thank you for joining us today. Well, um, being a great lover of Christmas and celebrations, I have heard this today. Um, and it's also just really exciting that after um, all the, the stress of COVID times, we finally really need to come out as a community and just celebrate all these wonderful events. So, um, yeah. I look forward, I really look forward to the parade when it, when it comes to that time. Uh, wish it was. Does it have a date? <laughs> yeah. Twenty six. Ah, there it is. Yeah. What up? Yeah. Oh, would you like me to read it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs>
Recommendations. That Whangarei District Council 1 approves the proposal to temporarily close the following roads to ordinary traffic for the Whangarei Christmas Parade on the following date in accordance with the Transport Vehicular Traffic Road Closure Regulations 1965. Saturday 26th of November 2022, Railway Road from Woods Road to End of Railway Road, 8am to 2pm. Woods Road from Albert Street to Railway Road, 10.50am to 12.45pm. Albert Street from Cameron Street to Woods Road, 10am to 1pm. Cameron Street from John Street to Albert Street, 11am to 12.45pm. Cameron Street Laneway from James Street to John Street, 7am to 4pm. James Street from Robert Street to James Street, 7am to 4pm. Two, approves the pro proposal to temporarily close the side roads off the roads to be closed for up to 100 metres from the intersection for safety purposes. And three, delegates to the Chair of the Infrastructure Committee and General Manager Infrastructure the power to give public notice of these proposed temporary closures, to consider any objections and to either approve, cancel or amend any or all of the temporary road closures if applicable. So I hope the weather is great and we might even see Santa. Well, we might see Santa. <laughs> Woo I hope we're having good little, good children. Thank you, Councillor Councillor I'm just making sure that I registered my interest here because the, the Rotary Club of Whangarei South, which I'm a member of, which I am also actively involved with the parade as well. Oh, thank you for that. And one of the elves. Councillor Martin. Yes, I just, um, part three with the Chair of Infrastructure, I'm only temporary until <laughs> the act. I just wonder whether that's, uh, if there's objections after that, will that just be dealt with by the General Manager. Yes, Jim's got more shoulders. He's going to have to take that off. Okay. Yeah. It's a good, it, is, it is a good point. It may have been um, yeah. edited, yeah. but um, I can't anticipate it being more than the shoulders. Oh, and our Carolee and Mira. Yes, yes, and we've got good delegations that we've covered off yeah. for the election year. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Pollock? I'm looking forward to a big birthday party for me because this oh. is on my birthday. <laughs> but no, it's it's great that we're actually supporting this to go through the middle of town to provide the, um, the collaboration for the communities for, for far and wide um, since the unfortunate disbanding of the other community parades that we have had around the place um, for multiple reasons. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm hoping to be running through with uh, friends on that day as well. That on that day, maybe not necessarily in the parade, but um, we'll see how things go. <laughs> looking forward to it. Three happy birthday for the day. Does anyone see the discussion? I'll put the motion. Those in favour, aye. 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 Against. Carried. Item six point four: the Two to Park and Marina Trust request for a loan. The recommendations are on page ninety. Councillor Pops is moving the recommendation to the seconding. Yeah, and I'm a clear again, I'm a trustee and I'm actively involved with the trust at the moment, very actively. So, Councillor Martin, are you going to withdraw from the discussion? I just, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take part. Thank you. Councillor Pops. Okay, thank you, Worship. So, uh, recommendation to Council. Council agrees to provide funding to the trust to a value of 750000 Marks through a maximum of three drawdowns with all funds to be repaid within five years to the initial drawdown. In B, delegates to the Chief Executive to finalise terms and conditions of the funding, including drawdown, interest, and repayment to upon receipts of satisfactory cash flow projections. Your Worship, we're all pretty well aware of this request has come from uh, costs due to an unexpected storm damage, and uh, it's been highlighted around uh, through the media, through Council, that uh, they need assistance. And it's a very, very valuable marina in the area, and uh, I've got, I fully support the application. Thank you. Councillor Hulse, would you mind if we just add the words to Department Marina Trust into the uh, your motion? No just problem to be, at all. To be clear, so that it's uh, a matter of record. And yes. the second, Councillor Murphy, would like that to be added. Thank you. Any further debate? Councillor Innes. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, I was pleased to see uh, within the report that you're actually looking at the redesign of, of the uh, 
Marina and was it like for like? Uh, I can see that um, with the redesign uh, with uh, potentially future tsunami events uh, if it will minimise uh, that impact. So I think when we have a look at the loan there is a definitely a lot more benefit going forward than just replacing what was there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd just like to say here yeah, that the day of that tsunami, it was it was it was shocking and it was devastating, and um, I think the whole community really felt the impact. Um, everyone was absolutely just devastated when we went to Tūtukaka and saw what had happened um, happened there and, and the damage to the marina, which was so significant. Um, and so, obviously, it's a huge asset to the community. It's managed extremely well. Um, and I think it's it's wonderful that we can um, make a loan um, uh, so that the trust can ensure that the rebuild is carried out to a high standard. Um, there's something else I was going to say, but I've forgotten. That's all, thank you. Any further questions? I just, just wish to note that there were other options that have been considered, and uh, including in either a grant or or an underwrite and, and um, that, you know, uh, that the trust themselves could apply for a loan. But I do agree and I will be uh, supporting the recommendation today for a loan to the Tutukaka Marina Management Trust, uh, given that the, uh, that's also one of their pre preferred options. So I'm happy to support that today. Remember the other thing I was going to say. It's your it's your grace. I was actually just going to say the other day we um, would, were uh, told about the new tsunami sirens and the fact that the Tutankhamun Marina is going to have one of the new um, sirens, which is going to be much louder, and that they will have the autonomy to be able to set it off themselves. So I think that's actually that's fantastic, and it's really important. It means because the impact of a tsunami can be very localised and have a huge impact just on the Tutankhamun Marina. For them to be able to um, trigger the siren themselves is really fantastic. Any further discussion? That's the whole. Only to say that um, this is a good way to make sure we support our trustees. You know, most of them have volunteered and put hours of work into it, and uh, it's a council owned facility, so I'm happy for it. I'll put the motion. Those in favour, aye. 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 Against? Carried. Item 6.5, page 94 of the agenda of the Makata Marina Loan Agreement. Councillor Just Ellis. before you do, conflict of, conflict of, I'm a trustee on the uh, Cara Marina Management Trust. Um, I just want to note, I don't think I've got a conflict though. Uh, and this is the Whangarei Harbour Marina Management Trust. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, noted that Councillor Holtz and uh, the Marina <coughs> Councillor Innes. Are you moving the... Yes, I am. I'm moving the With a slight correction, I think the words need to be added in here. Whereas, make available a $5 million loan to the Whangarei Harbour Marina Management Trust for the facilities. Okay. Those words need to yes, be added in there. Yeah, that's fine. So, the Councillor Yep. Councillor Ennis. Thank you, Richard. Uh, we, when I read through the report and discussions that have been had in relation to the marina, I see that this is a really uh, belt and braces approach that we have in front of us. Uh, I see that really the economic development uh, uh, from the marina and particularly that we have a, a strong uh, marine uh, industry that uh, and it's gaining in strength that we have looked at from a strategic perspective uh, in our planning. Uh, what we have here uh, is really uh, insurance. I think insurance cover was absolutely uh, vital in this, along with indemnity and an independent assessment of credit quality. So um, uh, it's with pleasure that I move this because I see another step in our economic development. Uh, and uh, it, it's definitely part of our future uh, as a district, uh, particularly as a city, in terms of reinforcing uh, the marine industry. So, um, thank you, Worship. Thank you, Councillor Ennis. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I agree. 
Uh, with the, and I support the motion as it's been put. Uh, I think it's exciting. I agree that it enhances our economic development. One cautionary note that I would add is that there is a private uh, marina development further down the river. We as a council don't want to give an unfair advantage to a uh, council marina when there's a private person doing the uh, same thing. And so I would um, ask the Chief Executive to uh, make sure, one, that our council is not financially, and it says in there our balance budget isn't compromised, but two, that the terms are reasonably commercial so that the competition is fair. Thank you. Yeah, Madam Chair, it's the reason I'm, yeah, I'm glad that the words got added there because it's for, for consistency. But I'm actually going through the budget, going through the information there that's been provided. They've actually shown very clearly that they can pay it back, which is one of the big things I like to see. That, and they've actually put some allowance in there for, for paying it back, so if it goes a little bit over. Um, it's actually looking really, really good from, from that side of things, and I don't believe there'll be a conflict with other organisations because we're looking at two different types of styles of, of uh, marinas, and it's, it's you know, Whangarei is well known amongst the, the world of the yachting world that it's, it is a safe harbour for them to dock in, it's a protected harbour for them to dock in, and I think providing extra facilities is only just a benefit for the district and benefit for the Whangarei community. Thank you, we should, um, I feel I should speak on this one because I've been involved in their planning for such a very long time um, and supporting the reason for um, expanding the marina is that the current marina is over full, over Kuntan. We just prescribed, that's the word, thanks to Council House. Um, and I would just like to point out that this one has been in the planning stages long, long, long before any private um, facilities were envisaged. So I'm assuming that the private facilities will have taken into calculation that this has been in the planning stages for such a long time. And I do hope that the private ones are consulting with the hapu to the extent that the Wangarei Harbour Trust have been consulting every step of the way. Um, and have been supported every step of the way by the trusts, by the um, hapu locally. Um, I'd just like to mention that everybody has on their desks probably um, confirmation from the trust of the questions that were asked in our workshop. I mean, this is a really important extension, as Councillor Innes has said, for our local economy. This is an internationally recognised um, well, marine facility itself and also our, sh our marine industry is recognised as being as good as if not better than anywhere else in the world. People come. I've been fortunate to be able to address the um, incoming yachties and departing yachties for a number of years while I've been in council. They have a little um, welcome and goodbye for them as they come in at the end of one hurricane season and leave, leave again before the next. And the comments that we're favoured with from the international visitors that come from all around the world, and they've travelled to ports all around the world, and at this point I also want to say, because this is bound to come up in another council, people wanting to rename the town basin the key because the town basin sounds like a basin. Well, it is a basin. It's the jewels in the crown. It collects the, the benefits of our district, and it benefits everybody. And the yachties say, when you meet somebody in San Francisco and say, I'll see you again in the town basin, they know exactly where you're going. If you say, I'll see you at the quay, well, it could be just down the road. There's at least a 1,000 keys around the world that the Yachties frequent, apparently. So, remember, keep the town basin because it is unique. Thank you. Thank you, this day. Perhaps just, uh, just before I give a right of reply, um, Whanganei Tilinga Parawa as a harbour has, uh, for time immemorial, we had vessels coming in and out and providing safe haven and um, trade, no doubt. Uh, I just want to highlight the fact that we've got 
uh, facilities at One Tree Point. We've got some new facilities at Port Nico. We've got the Funday Harbour uh, Marina, which is at capacity, uh, and uh, Kissing Point, and uh, potentially a new one with the Orkara Marina. There's definitely demand, and I, um, as Councillor Dean pointed out, we provided safe haven, safe harbour for many people through COVID-19, the international yachties who um, really, really treated their time here in, in Fun Bay. Uh, and perhaps if we are a unique name for the town basin, we can call it Ahi, Ahi Pupurangi, because there ain't another one of those in the world either. <laughs> uh, but yeah, very happy to provide this financial support to the Trust to carry on their good work. Council Clark. Um. I just want to um, say thank you very much for the letter that's been provided as well to kind of reassure us that they will be providing um, support. Um, this isn't necessarily to do with this, but I just wanted to give kudos to the, um, the, the trust who have, when we had the 2020 floods, were out there in their boats dealing with all the debris that came through and moving it away so that the boats were actually able to be free. But the effort that they went to to also try to Pull out as much rubbish that they did rather than just letting it flow out to the sea. So um, I just want to pay kudos to the, the, the team who were out there and doing that, especially when the, all the weather was still being very good. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, uh, thank you, Worship. And just a bit of a round up here because uh, uh, I think water, qu water quality in the harbour is uh, fundamental and, and that is very much taken into account. Uh, with the marina and of course uh, with water quality comes uh, recreation and part of that is catching fish in the harbour which is quite passionate uh, to my own heart. But um, I'd really like to uh, acknowledge um, uh, <coughs> Councillor um, Cooper's comments. I, I feel that uh, it's a situation that um, if we were looking at subsidising uh, a marina we would have made a grant and uh, I see here that uh, it's a loan, and we've just made a loan through to Tudukaka. They're fundamental to our economic base, uh, and I feel quite comfortable uh, with the approach we have here, and uh, I look forward to uh, this motion being passed. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks very much. I'll put the motion. Those in favour, aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Item 7.1, the financial report for the two months ending the 31st of August 2023. Ellen? Council's recommendation is on page 124. We'll have a move for the recommendation. Council Martin is moving. Council Reid is seconding. Council Martin. The recommendation is that the Council notes the operational results from the two months ended 31st of August 2022. And I'll leave the rest up there. Any debate? We've stunned, we've given away some money and now we're looking for finances. That's why we need a finance committee, yeah? No. Wow. Any time we heard that? Any discussion? I'll put that motion, those in favour, aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Item. <coughs> 7.2, the Capital Projects Report for the two months ending the 31st of August 2022. We're going to move for the recommendation. Councillor Ellis is moving. Councillor Cooper is seconding. Councillor Ellis. Uh, Self-explanatory, uh, if you wish. Thank you. Now, with interest on page 144, we're tracking the head of our uh, previous year's spend. It is very early days. Very early. Ambitious. Program of work. Any further discussion? Put that motion in favour. Aye. 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 Against? Carried. Item 7.3, page 146, the Capital Projects Delivery. Next year. Councillor Hulse is moving. Councillor Peters is seconding. Thank you, Councilor Richard. The reason I uh, wanted to move this was just from the request I made at the last council meeting. So uh, thanks very much for the staff for getting back pretty promptly on this. But it does highlight a few concerns that uh, I think Councillor Martin and I certainly have about um, some of our subsidies from Walker to Tahi being very, very late, and that's dependent on a lot of our progress, so we acknowledge that. You know, so our staff, are, you know, because that's late, you know, by rights, 
lot of our tin that's already there should be just about to be finalised now, so we can get into the construction period. But when you see it in detail, uh, you can understand some of the delays. And the other one is on page 148, it says about uh, we don't have the right capacity or capability to deliver the side complex of the programs. Um, I just want to probably put forward some of the ways we've got past this in the past is to use out more outside consultants, more outside people. And at one stage, our works and services department, which is now infrastructure, we actually had a manager who come from the outside industry. And he remained here for six years. Uh, he just had no industry experience, but he has appointed manager to manage the changes we needed to manage. And uh, so within house staff, they tend to look within house and solve all the problems. So, so I'm often <coughs> challenge to senior staff is just look outside council now and again and see what help you can get to actually maintain the, the, the uh, impetus we're trying to get of us improving our delivery of capital projects. Thanks very much, Councillor Holtz. Councillor Zinni, for the discussion. Yeah. Just, just on that very point, it has been held up, and Waka Katahi actually did a good job of getting the extra funding out of the government so that we could fund the programs that we had. And although it was delayed, at least we, we did get that funding. And Jim and I have been, Mr. Sefton, <laughs> um, have um, had two or three discussions in the last week or two about options and variations and things. So he's definitely in that space where we're looking at ways of doing things and bringing more contractors and stuff into the system. So that's really positive going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, I just wanted to say thank you for the report. It's something that has come up a number of times and Councillor Holtz has championed, championed, but championed the cause for a while. Um, but I, I thought it was a really nicely written, really clear, really simple, easily understood um, report. And I just wanted to thank the staff for that and I hope that it might be the, the start of, uh, of some plain English infrastructure reports for the next council in the future. Thank you for that, Jim. Councillor Murphy. Thank you. Um, just on page 150, I just wanted to um, make a statement, a statement <coughs> here. Um, I also think it's a really good report. These are, these are common, complex programs. The Blue Green Network and City Centre require a lift in focus and resourcing. We currently don't have program managers in place for these programs. And I just wanted to point those out because I think those are actually two critically important uh, pieces of work. And I just wanted to draw Council's attention to that, anyone who's going to be um, here in the next term. Um, and actually in my valedictory speech, I'm going to speak to the delivery network as well. But I just thought that um, our manager has made a, a very astute, um, has, has really hit the nail on the head with that one. Thank you. No, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> no, I just wanted to get that It's not very often in this department. Of, of, uh, I was reading this the other day, and in page 149, I said, the first two things under procurement, and Robin hammering that, the way I put it for a was excellent because establish a forward works program to liaise with contracts so they can tool up and increase in capacity with confidence. Isn't that good? And that's exactly what we should be doing. So, not often I give them the good and the excellent, but <laughs> it's a good start. <laughs> but more, uh, more importantly, it goes on here, this is our, our delivery to our public on all, all the things we put in our annual plan. It's quite interesting, reading our annual report the other day, we still had a million dollars in our personnel costs unspent. And so I'm putting the challenge out there, use the money, it's in a budget, get the right people in the right job and catch up with the jobs we need to do. Thanks very much. Right, we'll replies we have. I'll put that motion, those in favour aye. 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 Against? Item 7.4, the living wage. Councillor Cutforth has a motion that she would like to vote. I just want a second. <laughs> 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 I wanted to um, just make sure that, that all councillors had the revised. No. A motion, which is, so I'll just read it out, we're going to read it anyway. 
that Council commit to a staged implementation of the living wage for directly employed contractors who deliver regular and ongoing core services with cleaning contracts as a priority in the next 12 months. And it has been seconded by Council Connor. Council Cutler. Thank you, Thank you um, We've had a number of reports over the years. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, it's not over the years, but over the last year, I guess, um, into the living wage issue. Um, all our council staff, I'm really pleased to say, are paid the living wage and have been now for a few years, which is um, $23.65 an hour, not exactly an extraordinary amount of money. $946 gross, I think I worked it out as just probably about 800 Yet. So when you consider that two bedroom flats in Palmer are four hundred fifty dollars a week, then you know you're not leaving a lot for the fifteen percent increase in fruit and vegetable costs over the last year, Councillor Hoss. So looking for your support for this one. So um, the next step really is, is as we've been discussing, looking at um, people who are not council directly employed staff, but who are doing essential council services. And we went through, Jenny and I went through a firstly an exhaustive list of something like 748 contractors that Jenny had identified. I was like, no, 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 no. We're looking at a handful of contractors who in some other councils would be employed as council staff. Our cleaners, our parks and rec staff, our security staff, our dog control people. Those core essential services that if we didn't do them, or if we didn't contract people to do them, there ain't nobody else going to do them. It is a core local government service. So it's looking at extending um, our living wage, 23.65 now, to those people. Now we've discussed it in December. We discussed it again in February. Here we are now. Let's just move the next step along. And that's why I was um, pleased with Jenny's support to actually put on a recommendation that is a bit more than just receiving information, it is taking that next step. And if you look at the report, you can see that actually a number of our key contractors have already done that. The Armour Guard contract and the City Key contract, both are now paying their people a living wage. So it's really taking it the next step and looking at the cleaners and just remind council and cast your eye, cast your minds back, you know, 780 days to COVID, when actually, our cleaners and our central staff are the ones who are out there still doing the money, still doing the work. And these are the people who I think um, completely justify us extending, um, extending the living wage through to those people. So I'm really hoping that Council will um, indulge, not just indulge me, but indulge all those people who work for us to provide that service by taking this next step. Sorry. Sorry, Your Worship. Um, a lot of the councils haven't actually got this motion yet. I've had to find a motion on it. So. <laughs> of cleaners and yet we don't expect them to be paid for. It's like nobody wants to do that job, but there is a need, it has to. And it's great that we have people that do it out there and do it. And to the ability <coughs> that they are. I find it quite interesting really where sometimes we, we look to central government to tell us what to do and at other times we say, no, we, we want to do things ourselves. Well, how about we do that now? Right now, right now, the percentage between the minimum wage and living wage is, is smaller than it has ever been. It is a small raise in that to ensure that people actually are able to live. It is not to make major profits. It's not to... 
so they can get from A to B, get around the place, actually provide, eat, get food, supply their, their families, and whatnot. Words have just jumbled. <coughs> Fully supportive of this. Um, and as some people might look at it as it's, it's a halo thing, or what's the, what's the cost that it's going to be? What's the cost if we don't support these people who then have to maybe have to find another job somewhere else because they can't afford um, the, the ex expanding um, housing costs that they have to deal with? That we have to look at this um, crisis that has slowly been incrementing towards Looking after the people that are in these situations is imperative, especially when they look at us and say, well, you just sit around and talk, you don't do anything. Well, we try, we do try and try to support them, and even when we often get slammed for, for one thing or another, we are out there looking after our communities that we have, that we do try. We do take into account these people, and I really hope that we can support those. The council is about being strategic. If we strategically want to reduce the gap between rich and poor, we have to ensure that those on the least wage uh, act, get as much as we can actually um, support them to get. And this is a step towards that. It's not a great, an enormous step but it is a move towards an equitable society, which I think is a really important strategic move for Whangarei. Thank you, Councillor. Yes, Councillor Innes. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, we're, we're going to go through a period of inflation. Uh, and uh, I was fortunate enough, or unfortunate enough, which way, the way you look at it, to actually work for Council uh, in a period of high inflation. And, and I understand uh, the implications of high inflation. I pick up really on, uh, although uh, probably a little bit briefer than uh, Councillor um, Connor, uh, in terms of the implications of that uh, on uh, the average uh, person. And uh, I feel that uh, as a council, uh, part of our our team are our contractors and the culture that we have as a council going forward and a commitment to public service, uh, of which we all are very much part of. So I see uh, Jenny in terms of uh, Armaguard and in terms of City Care, they're our two big contractors and uh, they, they've been able to come to the party uh, in terms of that. And I see that it's crucially important, that or well, critically important, as a councillor cut for it's critically important, uh, that uh, council actually uh, commits to a stage implementation of the living wage. Because in times of uncertainty, uh, with inflation, uh, we, we need to make uh, a team approach to this, but uh, I'm also mindful uh, that um, uh, the cost comes back to the ratepayer as well. Uh, but I, I think the benefits of actually having a team approach with our contractors is important. Uh, thank you, Worship. So I'll be supporting the motion. Councillor Ellis, Councillor Benny. Just a, a couple of questions. Um, so it, it, the, the motion to me is quite vague. Uh, Stage implementation, what does that mean? Over what stage? Is that over 15 years, 10 years, six months? Uh, I, I don't know. So any, any comment on that? Um, I'm in discussion through the chair. I'm in discussion at the moment with the planning contractors. That's been quite a, a part of this process. So um, and they are very keen <coughs> to uh, start this. And I know council employees who work with those contractors are very keen to get done away. So I would suggest it's going to happen within the next year or whenever the contract comes up for you, whichever is the important so, Thanks. It brings me to the next question. Ongoing call services, regular and ongoing call services. I just is that narrow enough for us to understand who gets that and what is a regular and ongoing call service? Um, so I, I just throw that in and I don't really expect an answer, I just, it's a, it's a little bit vague for me. 
And the only thing that's missing for me is what is this going to cost? Um, so that's that's the question, and, and again, I, I I don't expect an answer because I, I don't imagine you have an answer. So yeah. Um, so if I, if I can speak to it, um, in in principle, as we as we were in, in principle, this is a, a, a really great initiative, um, but this is what we talk about on the fly. Um, stage implementation for core services, it, it's, it's too vague for me. I look at the risks. Um, the risks, th there's a whole heap of risks that we've listed in the agenda. Um, in particular, um, that the increased costs will go to the ratepayers, and we don't know what those costs are. So it would be really difficult for me to vote for this um, and then go out tonight and campaign that we're going to reduce race or rates or we're going to keep rates where they are, when we've just voted for this, which will, in all likelihood, increase rates. So while it's giving living wage to the, the, the workers themselves, which need it, and, and we all agree that they need it, but I just note that, that Armaga and City Safe have put it up to the living wage without this piece of, of, of work. And so, I, I just I struggle with the concept that we can tell our contractors how much to pay their people. We can't tell anybody else, anybody else, so the contractors who contract to other companies, they don't tell them how much they can pay, their, 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 how much they have to pay their, their wages. So, I, well, in, in principle, I think this is a, a really good motion. I can't support it because there's not enough details for me. And in particular, there is no details on this would, what this would cost us and whether we would in, need to increase our rates. Thank you, Councillor Benny. Thank you, Lightning. Um, yes, I, I know the last time this came to Council and I, I actually, I, I, I did actually vote against it, but um, I've got the pleasure of knowing a kid called Wade Brock and he reads our water meters. Um, he has to use his own car and petrol to go out to um, all of Northern, um, and it costs him thirty dollars to go to my food to read a meter, and he gets paid four dollars for that. He has to live at home, obviously. He has to pay for his own signage, equipment, ovals, everything. He doesn't get a uniform, nothing. Doesn't get a subsidy for petrol, nothing. So. I, I agree with Councillor Benny absolutely that it, it's, you know, that this is sort of put on the ratepayers possibly, and I know that I'm going to vote like that. Um, but I don't know if anyone would be able to say that that is acceptable for weight. Um, so I will be today supporting Councillor Thank you. Um, I think this comes down to how you value all people. Um, I used to work for CBEC Eco Solutions and everyone, no matter um, what their role was paid, the same wage, um, because that was the um, philosophy of the organisation. Um, and I'm sitting here listening to Councillor Benny say, can we afford it? And I have been guiltily eating these massive council lunches um, which I cannot even finish, I don't think any of us can. They come in a box this big, and it's literally probably enough for three meals. In fact, there's probably a lot of people in Whangarei who that would feed their family for a day. So I'm sitting here feeling very ashamed that we, at lunchtime, go out there and greedily eat our lunches, well, we, and we do appreciate them, I don't want to say that we don't appreciate them, we do appreciate them, but um, I just wanted to raise that point. My other point is that, um, so if you look at the, and it's just gone off my screen, but if you look at the, the total there for the minimum wage, um, if you work a 40 hour week, that's $756 a week. The average um, rent in Whangarei for a two bedroom house is $480 and the average rent for a three bedroom house is $498. So if you're earning $756 a week and you're spending $500 on rent, that leaves you less than $300 for groceries, power, food, oh, sorry, groceries, power, phone, clothing and all the other things that you've got to pay. 
Um, I just think it's it's such a small amount to add to what we're already paying them. I think it shows that we value them, we appreciate them, we respect them. I mean, crikey, as a councillor, I'd be happy to go without my lunch if it meant paying um, a living wage to the people who are cleaning the toilet for me. So I'm happy to support this today and I actually really thank, thank Councillor Cutforth um, for bringing it. Actually, could I just ask the question, I don't know if any of the staff here know, but what is the bill of our um, councillor lunches over a year? Was it? $25,000. So thanks to the ratepayer for that, because I really, you know, we're, we're pretty lucky, aren't we? You must be chucking in. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Councillor Dean. Thank you. Um, much as I would love to support Councillor Cutforth in our last day of working together in this chamber, <laughs> absolutely, I do feel that we are stepping right outside absolutely. the role of what the ratepayer needs to be involved in. And as for lunches, we might eat the lunch, but we also supply a job for a lot of people involved in preparing those lunches. You don't have to eat them, you can take them down to the Sally's and give them away. If that's how you feel. Personally, I eat mine because I actually really enjoy it. <laughs> However, I think, you know, we're stepping outside the realms of what the role that we have been engaged in in support of our ratepayers. Well, who are we to tell our contractors what they should be paying their staff? Does it mean that in actual fact they have one staff person less? So in order to get a contract at a rate that council is prepared to pay via the rate payer, to get that contract they may need to reduce their staff by one person in order to be able to pay the rest of them the living wage. We don't know that. We don't, as Councillor Benny said, we don't have all the information that we would need for me to make a decision on this and I don't think that's procrastination, I think that's caution because when I read through the risks that are associated with this, I think we actually need to think it through properly and stop trying to take over the government's role. The government is busily organising pretty much our lives in general and the wage rate that everybody everywhere gets. So I don't think we should be setting up our contractors for failure, which should be easily equipped with. But we don't know that because we don't have the information. So Demi? Councillor yeah, Chair, the, the question I have here, and it's already been raised, but I would actually like an answer if I can. Do we know what's an indication of cost we are going to be looking at for an increase? That is the biggest challenge of this exercise, is working out who, what the cost is going to be, and that is what we're working through at the moment. So um, by meeting with the contractors, we'll be able to establish what the difference is, um, what they're paying at the moment, you know, and we'll as you say, actually get the facts and then uh, establish the cost, which I will be able to bring back to you in that broader sense. So, Madam Chair, the way the motion is written, it states in, in the staged implementation, isn't this what standard practice of running council actually is, leaving that up to the management to actually do that job? Mm -hmm. That is, is, is that not why we employ a CEO, Madam Chair? It is a rhetorical question. However, um, this is about uh, setting a, a, a clear direction if it goes through for the next stages. Okay. In that case, I'll speak to it, Madam Chair. I actually have a real issue with this because it is actually, as, as Councillor Deeming has actually stated, it is actually stepping over the line of central government's role. They have already indicated quite clearly what they will be doing this year and over the next, over the next three or four years in relation to the living wage and also what people are to be paid. This is something that local government should not be involved in. We should be actually looking at what our infrastructure is, which is what our core position and job is involved with in council. When we employ contractors, we are requiring them to come to us with what sort of cost that they will be doing their jobs with. That is not to do with wages. Wages are to do with the contractual process between them and their staff. I am concerned that we are stepping over that line between central government and local government. 
Our role here is very, very clear, and I cannot support the motion at the present moment. Yes, well, <coughs> how does it work when they have people under training? And one of the big issues is when we have contractors who subcontract to us part of the time, and they have an employment contract with their workers, how are they going to pay a different rate when they're working for us? And if it's unaffordable, they're not going to tender for the job. So there's all of those things that we need to look at. And it's all very well talking to the contractors that we've already got, but we're just talking now about getting more contractors and future contractors in. And I can guarantee you, if anyone's got a worker who's working for them, they won't be even on that page. If they're, if they're doing their role, most of the people that I deal with are way above that because they're workers. They value their workers and they pay them. But if we put this mandatory thing in there, I just think we should be leaving it up to our contractors and to the people who do the employing who know how to operate their business. Thank you, Your Worship. I absolutely um, acknowledge the, the speakers who have been and who wish to improve the lot of people who are on a minimum wage and are not being paid the living wage. Uh, and the inequity in the community is real and it does need to be addressed. However, as uh, people who are responsible for paying uh, the payment of money that has been collected under rates sometimes off people on fixed incomes and think of the elderly on their pensions uh, who are facing exactly the same costs. The fundamental flaw that we have in this motion is that we are signing a blank cheque and we just don't know. I don't believe that is good uh, governance uh, and improvement of us to do that. So it is with regret that this, that this has come so early without the full information. If we had the full information, we may well view it differently, but I can't support it today. That's right. That's right. Thank you, Your Worship. Just, I would not want to be the person that tells a contractor what they have to pay to your staff. Um, when I apply for a contract, I don't divulge what I pay my staff. If anyone tells me that I have to pay the minimum wage, I will gladly drop the rate, but I'd have no workers. So we just need to be very cautious here that we don't go setting precedents for the staff of contractors who are already on more than the minimum wage. Because it just might open the door for the contractor to try dropping. Just the devil's advocate here, thinking outside. That's great. Councillors, when Councillor Cutforth initially started this, she said all council staff are on the living wage. I've got the answer for any rate increase. We pay our staff the living wage. Imagine if all of the people who provide the incredible service to our community are only paid the living wage. That is really unfair to expect that. So imagine being a person who provides an, an essential core service to our community with less than a living wage. I absolutely wholeheartedly support the motion. It is a staged implementation of the living wage. In our report, our staff had said that they would already undertake direct, plan to undertake direct discussions with T2 and T3 contractors and report back to Council in the new year. Great, let's continue that process. But for me, we are expecting people to do for our ratepayers less than a living wage? Unfair. I happily would also take a big pick up, I think we all would, some would to ensure that it is equitable for our whole community. Councillor Cuthbert, you're right the Thank you, Marcia. Wages aren't the main or sole driver of job satisfaction for people, but if you're on a really low wage, 
Wages are really, really critical. And they're not just about the money, though that is incredibly important for people on the low wage. It is about how you are viewed and how you are viewed by the people you work for. And in this case, the people we're talking about work for us and they work for our rate payers. So one of the questions we had was, who are we to tell our contractors what they should be paying? Well, we are the council and the contractors are people who are provided services for council, essential services. Somebody else said, this is a blank check. Well, <clears throat> when we award contracts, we adjust the contract amounts all the time to take into account increase, increased costs, whether it's supply chain issues, whether it's material costs. Only wages are the things that people tend to get sort of so um, excited about. We're talking about moving from a minimum wage of $21.20 to $23.65 for directly contracted council employee, um, employee, con contract employees. People say we haven't had the information. Well, I'll just take you back to the April report where, in the case of Whangarei District Council, these people would fall into the following categories regulatory, security, cleaning. <coughs> Roading maintenance, parks maintenance, and waste. Take you back to the report in December. I mean, we have had this information. The Chamber of Commerce was in here a couple of months ago talking about the critical importance of the essential services that are offered by people in the city who are contracted directly by our contractors and saying they deserve to be paid more for the work they do. And I think that includes people who clean out toilets. So I would really encourage councils this time. Councillor Martin pointed out that a number of people already paid more than that, and certainly our trade contractors have been paid more than living wage because you actually have to try and get these staff, and the demand the demand is so high that wages then do become a bit of a lever. So I would really encourage councils this time to think about the people who work for us, who are contracted by us to do the work that we value, and just on the right side of history with this one. Thank you. Councillors Go Lightning, Cutsworth, Murphy, Peters, Connor, Innes, and Her Worship the Mayor. Bless you, Dr. I can count. Those against. Councillors Deeming, Cockerello, Benny, Cooper. Martin, Holst, and Reed. Uh -huh. That's <laughs> seven, seven, isn't it? Yay. Come on. Last one, Jay, right over to four. Isn't that cool? Yep. Yeah. Last yeah. The very last one, yeah. I get to support the people who do the money. Oh, yeah, I will go to the front. I said 8.1. Valedictory speeches. Oh, wait, 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 what? Thank you, Worship. This is a um, good recommendation to the the last one I had to read out. So, the Council make the recommendation to the Cardinal Area Strategic Partnership Standing Committee. The, um, the reason this is the very late on everyone's desk is we only made the decision yesterday to make sure we made the agenda today, and so it's work in progress. But this is a position paper of the Cardinal Area, our partnership agreement. Where we've got to, what we want to continue with, work and train, and direction for staff. So it's, yesterday the committee forwarded this, made a decision to forward it onto council for a decision. We all know that incoming mayor and incoming council has to review their committees. We know the mayor might want to go a totally different way. Uh, we, so this is a position paper, so we do not want to lose traction we made this term in council. And I think that's very, very important. Uh, I think uh, one of the highlights that comes through to Carter areas is the input we've had but going out to Mariah and, and hearing first hand the, the problems of 
having that community, and I think that's one of the highlights of the whole too, is uh, how we're starting to engage and, and how well our hovering groups are actually, um, are, they've taken the role very, very, very seriously and actually bring a really good debate into the, to our discussion. So I fully support going with this recommendation and bearing in mind it's up to the new council to make their final decision. Thank you. Um, it's been a privilege to be in Tikari there for this term and um, I'd like to endorse the chairing of Councillor Hulse uh, because I feel like quite often the stuff that we, we try to write to progress in council is very slow and I think that during that in Tikari I've seen movement actually during the term that's on a much greater scale and also it's a it's it, the debate is really really robust and really cool and very rich and so I am very much in support of the recommendation that the incoming mayor consider Takariata as a standing committee. Councillor Peters? Councillor Innes? Uh, thank you. Uh, just to echo uh, the comments uh, of Councillor Hulse and, and Peters, uh, there has been substantial progress uh, within this term of Council uh, to Karia in terms of, uh, as Councillor Hulse mentioned, going to Marae, sitting on Marae, understanding Tikanga. Uh, having that capacity, uh, unfortunately I don't have to be on, uh, might be a subject of my age rather than priority, <coughs> I would hope. Uh, and uh, also coming into the council chamber, uh, well, what's really interesting I've found is that on Marae, uh, we are very much engaged in Tikang. In terms of the council chamber, we're working under standing orders, um, Councillor Hobbs. Uh, and the debate we have, the understanding that it's giving us, I think, give us, gives us a level of comfort. And I know Councillor Benny, in terms of the uh, Co-Governance Housing Committee, again, it's a working party. Uh, it's one that getting down really sorting out the detail of going forward uh, and getting a strong engagement and commitment of both parties in terms of that. So I feel incredibly comfortable in uh, recommending uh, through to the new council uh, what we have in front of us. It's not as if it's something that has really come from uh, just the committee. It's something that has also come from the experience of Auckland Council and, and looking at the benefits uh, that they have. And I know that we, when we discussed uh, the question of co-governance, uh, I'd always really wanted to see that where we get results and outcomes from co-governance, we actually have them recorded. Because often what we have is that we always get the comments of the disadvantages. I, I would always want to see on agenda that we have uh, the benefits of co-governance, which are substantial having been on uh, the standing committee. So it's a good pleasure that uh, I would like to recommend this through to the new council. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, Councillor Councillor I have a question, Madam Chair. I, I note that it's just noting it, but the recommendations that have been put in there, which, have been, which we're noting, can they be seen as undermining the Māori Ward candidates who are actually going to be in those positions? Short answer, no. No. Councillors, uh, I will absolutely be noting the recommendations and I think it is important to expand on the recommendations. This is not just about setting up Te as a standing committee. Um, in response to uh, the, the issues that were raised by Tehuna, 
It is the need for Family and District Council to demonstrate a genuine and authentic Tetiriti partnership with Hapu, and that Hapu are seeking a pathway for more equitable representation in all of Council's operations and decision making. This includes having a presence on standing committees. This is not just about Tahiri. I need to highlight this. We've also, um, in these recommendations, note that uh, Takari and uh, Strategic Partnership Committee committed to undertake the groundwork to form recommendations for consideration in the next term of council where committee structures are set up. Forming the uh, recommendations for tenancy based decision making to council for consideration in the next training term for the new council, informed by options presented to council in a briefing held on the 12th of September. They're recommending uh, the Takaria that recommends that independent Hapu board members who sit with voting rights on each of the council's committees. Hapu standing committees with members who sit with voting rights on uh, see that? Hapu standing committee with members who sit with voting rights on each of the council's committees. Hapu membership on council committees, subcommittees, working partners, and advisory committees. Co-management with mana whenua of sites and activities. Proactive relationship with Tangata Whenua, Hapu, Iwi, Matawaka. That includes the establishment of committees, advisory groups, agreements, policies, and processes that involve participation and leadership from Tangata Whenua. And policies and actions that recognise Tangata Whenua rights and interests and provide for partnership, active participation, and protection of Tangata Whenua in Family District Council's decision making processes. These recommendations are going to the next council. They absolutely strengthen the fact that we have introduced Māori wars. They bring into this chamber proper treaty-based, activity-based decision-making and co-management principles. I'll hardly support it. And I hope the next council does too. Council O'Connor. <coughs> My whole heart support this as well. I sat through yesterday's Wikimedia meeting as a interested party, not of one of the committee, but in full support of it. The discussion around the table was quite interesting, and as usual, we've made some way forward. Um, I'd just like to highlight the now equitable position of the TPP wall <coughs> behind you, Your Worship. And look forward to a more equitable future. I have heard and seen so much and learned so much over my term and appreciate the effort and passion that have come with it. One thing that actually the young elected members um, at their presentation um, when they were down south, what I was able to watch from live streaming is Something that kind of actually highlighted something to me. That we are a bicultural country with a multicultural society. And we need to remember that when we go forward with these decisions, that we are in this position, equitably, with the Crown and the three. People of this land, and all the other inklings of war, how you'd like to be. Wholehearted support for this and looking forward to seeing this decision made. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Councillor Martin. Yep, I have a question. Why are we going through the democratic process right now, campaigning to get people elected? And we have a committee with eight members from the Hapu, eight members from Council, who have made all sorts of decisions. What about the other 99,500 people? When are we going to consult with them? When are we going to ask them what they think? And they're a mixture of all sorts of people. It's time that we ask the people what they wanted. When you go out to, to all these meetings at night to do campaigning and everything, and then we find that we're going to have people who are appointed and paid in here, um, who don't have to go through the process. We don't know who they're representing. And I just think that we need to do more work with the rest of the community to get the buy-in from them. I won't be supporting this. Councillor Holson has wrote a reply can explain yep. the process we're dealing with today. Any further debate? Councillor Cooper. Thank you very much, Your Worship. I think it's uh, important to keep 
uh, everything in context. And uh, what we have here are recommendations that have come from a very successful uh, committee which has, uh, for the first time, had equal numbers of couple members and council re elected representatives onto it. <coughs> not, no, not always. Correct. Just on oh, 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 area. Takari and Air has had a 50 50 partnership for. Oh, okay, so, okay. okay. First time in my term. Yeah. <laughs> so, I guess, uh, like I say, what, what these. These recommendations are, they are the voice that I guess hasn't been heard so strongly. They're aspirational as you would expect because people have had a chance to be involved. They indicate the direction of which uh, that committee thinks it would be wise for the future council to go. But it is only an indication, it is a recommendation. It is quite uh, without doubt that the new council will have to make the decision as to whether or not they accept those recommendations. So nothing is being forced onto the new council. It is just some notes, uh, recommendations, and we're noting it today. And I guess I would say that any new council should have the confidence to be able to look at those recommendations look at the climate in which they're operating, judge the support that there is in the wider community and reach, reach decisions which will move us forward in a manner that builds on the unity that we are seeking as a country in some very difficult times. So I will be supporting that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, yes. Most of the councils around here know that you know, when I you know, get involved with something, I like to see a good eating product. So uh, in this case, you know, we don't want to lose the traction we've already made. Uh, we've invested a lot of time, a lot of energy, and now we've got a full complement of staff in our mayor relationship. The department doing some pretty good work. So this is this is trying to stop things that being dropped down to to us from central government. You know, we you know our reaction with three waters. We oppose it in a lot of cases because they impose things on us. We can read the political climate quite clearly, or well, I certainly I can, where the central government intention is to improve all this in the forthcoming years. If we elected, this will be mandated. We went to the local government conference this year, Councillor Cooper and Worship the Mayor and I and Simon Weston, our CE, and the content in the local government, uh, local government conference was intense. Uh, there's a big involvement of this is what council's doing in best practice around the country. I'm not supporting of what they want to do, but what I'm saying here is we play to the, the rules of the game we're in. At the moment, we know what's going to happen. We know where we're positioned. We're in a position to actually get ahead of the game and not play catch up. We've, we're ahead of the game because we're now, clearly, we've got Huckle Reps who have stepped up the plate and make it a really, really good investment in their time, but also good investment into our decision making. That is nothing to be feared. What we want to do is, we don't want to have government say, we want you to do this with Marion and Northland. We're up for this, we're the local councillors elected on here by our ratepayers, and uh, I'm very, very comfortable in the position I'm in. I'm very comfortable in the position we've got our council to. So this is simply a recommendation that, like I said before, we do not want to lose the work we've done this term, but more importantly, we want to show leadership that we are up for the challenges, and bear in mind, we are doing all this before our, our local iwi have actually set a lot of their treaty funds. So we're actually ahead of the game, trying to get the best possible outcome. And right from the very, very first time we actually set this committee up with what we wanted to lift all the potential of people in our district and I think we're doing it by including and being very, very inclusive. So it's going to be very interesting for the first couple of meetings of the new council to go through but at the moment I'm extremely uh, pleased to have led a council, who, a, a committee of council where the councillors and the Hapu reps have sat around a table without a raised voice, without a, any uh, grandstanding but just got on, with, just got on with the business of actually what is the best outcome 
could we get as a community? And I think that should be highlighted. So thanks very much. <coughs>
Our Councillor Peters is still making a cup of tea. There she is. Uh, our final item on our final meeting of this final triennium of mine is uh, the eight, item 8.1 valedictory speeches. There is a recommendation on page 156 of the agenda and uh, the State Council notes the valedictory speeches from the outgoing meeting is not standing for re election. Councillor Paul Gorilla is moving, Councillor Reid is seconding. So today we have uh, five people in this room who are not standing for re election. Uh, we have Councillor Murphy, Councillor Cutforth, Councillor Deming, Councillor Innes, and we're going to go in that particular order. Um, so, firstly, I would like to invite Councillor Murphy to give you a valedictory. Thank you. And this feels really funny because I've only been here for two terms, which feels like about six minutes. Councillors like Councillor um, Deeming have given six terms of service. A lifetime. A lifetime. So I feel very conscious that I've only been here for six minutes. Tēnā koutou katoa. Why did I stand for council? Um, because I was passionate about healthy communities and helping to build strong environments. Um, my six years has been, as an elected member has been incredibly interesting, challenging and satisfying. Um, these are just some of the documents we worked on in my term of council and when you look through them you can just see a little bit of your flavour, you know, a little bit of something that you, that you were able to add into these. Um, it's been a journey of learning as I became familiar with council's many plans, policies and documents and I really enjoyed gaining an understanding of the process we go through when these are created. I saw that the democratic process works and it's interesting that there are people campaigning at the moment who question that process, but actually once you're in here, you realise that the democratic process is true um, and it works. That as elected members, we can speak to the needs and priorities of our communities <coughs> and that these are the building blocks that are used to create our plans and documents. And then I've put here, and I saw that our mayor, our kaumatua, kurumatua, um, ensured that the process was true and transparent. I'm very proud and also humbled that my decision making and the feedback I gave helped influence the direction that council is travelling in and has helped shape the form of our plans and policies. I'm so glad and I give thanks that our organisation is turning towards honouring our obligations to Te Tiriti or Waitangi as the foundation and beginning of any work we start to undertake as we start to learn what partnership with Tangata Whenua and Mana Whenua looks like. And a couple of those examples which um, on, on this term were the climate adaptation strategy and the housing strategy where we worked in partnership with our hapu partners right from the very beginning and I think that was an amazing experience. Um, then what I'm really excited about for the Future Council is, is having that as a foundation where Council is moving to next um, because I think Looking at the future, we just um, we just supported the recommendations from Te Kariria, and I think that that the future, um, yeah, is going to be is going to be really exciting. When you look at um, Te Mana o Te Wai, which is New Zealand's national policy statement for freshwater management, it's a concept that um, puts the well-being and health of our of our why, our rivers and our lakes and our aquifers at the centre of how we manage freshwater and I think that that's going to carry on to all the activities and business that Council undertakes. So I think, yeah, we're moving into a really exciting future. Um, I think the other thing that you realise when you get into Council is that we, we really are trying to do our best, you know, Council is trying to do the best that we can. We're out there, people are making individual decisions about the type of transport they use, whether they recycle or compost. Um, and Council is an enabler, we have to enable those things to happen. And we really, we really are trying. Um, I said earlier I was going to speak to this piece of work, the Blue Green Network Strategy, which I'm so excited about because um, <coughs> 
the wins from this will, will be multiple, and I really hope that whoever is the next mayor and whoever are the next councillors really take this on board. You've got um, riparian restoration, uh, outcomes for biodiversity, you've got stormwater and floodwater management, so with the climate adaptation you've got wins there. It's a brilliant strategy, so I really hope the next council picks that up, and um, as Mr Sefter now infrastructure manager said we haven't really got a project manager or the resource to push that forward but I think that, that would, would be well worth it. Um, I think what I'll do is I'm just going to go straight to actually um, some acknowledgements because there's too much to say this is quite overwhelming uh, so I think what I really want to say is that when I first got into council um, I was struck by the professionalism and the integrity of our staff and that was something that really blew me away was oh my goodness I get to sit in this chamber and have my say but our organisation is, is made up of the, this incredible group of professional, intelligent, articulate, well educated people. What a privilege to, have, to be able to have worked with, with staff. Um, so thank you very, very much. Um, I just also want to thank the public <laughs> because that was the other thing that was amazing. You know, I, I'm from Nungaru and so I really know and understand my community, but being representative for the Hukurangi Coastal Ward, then I got to know all these incredible people and community groups from all over the ward, all who are volunteers and doing amazing things for their community. It's just phenomenal. And I also want to just thank um, my colleagues, the other elected members. It's been such an amazing um, journey for me. Um, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, that's what I was going to finish on. Firstly, I just really want to thank Cheryl, our mayor, for being an amazing leader, because what, what role <coughs> you've had, and really this is your day, and I just want to acknowledge you for being beautiful person and I realised what you are, you are the Queen of Hearts, just like you are <laughs> when you get dressed up um, in the storybook character hunt at the library, you are truly the Queen of Hearts because you love <coughs> our district and you love all our people and as Robin Leifering said earlier, you have been an inclusive mayor um, and I just pay tribute to you. So, Aren't we all lucky we live in an amazing, beautiful place? We love it so much and I think um, we know what we need to do. All the, the solutions to every issue are actually out there, whether it's climate change, waste minimisation, you know, protecting and restoring our biodiversity. We know what the answers are, we just have to get on and do it. So best of luck to the next council. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>
the speeches that you've brought to the table. Uh, you've brought along principled leadership and you're admired by the many. Uh, Recognised throughout the award, we thank you. Two terms. Thank you very much. asked me um, more recently, have, have you enjoyed it? And I've, um, <laughs> I've sort of said, no, not really. <laughs> I can't really say that I have enjoyed it, but equally, I'm really glad I did it. And if I hadn't done it, I would have regretted it. But I do want to um, just reflect on a key issue which has just impacted me and people will no doubt know what I'm going to say, and Sharon's here too. Um, and it is the impact that the Hundabasa debate decision project had on my first term and actually other ensuing terms of council. Um, and the whole story of that project, and I, I'm sorry to not be lovely and like Anna Wills, but the whole story of that project has continued to fill me with with real sadness and real grief and, and real sorrow and, it, and that will not go away. And to me it, it does, it's sort of a, the biggest stain I guess on the, I feel on the legacy of this council in the time I've been here. Um, so I want to actually talk a little bit about the lessons of that and also pay homage, homage, homage to the old Harbour Board building which no longer exists. And just say to council, you know, like every other project that we do, and I really hope now in terms of the lessons from that project into the future, is remembering that we're leaving a legacy 20, 30, 50 years out for people who come after us. We do that with roading projects, we do that with the water treatment plant, we do that with the airport, do that with the civic centre. We think about things with the future in mind. And I do really fear for what that building will be like in 20, 30, 50 years' time. Because the, that project was promoted primarily by a certain age of person, a certain group of people, um, a certain type, a certain belief system. And I think even if you look at it now, it's generally... Um, really enjoyed by older people who like the, the fact that it's different and by young people who like the sort of bright primary type colours. Um, my concern, and this is not about Kundabas' work because I have every respect for his work, that that particular naive type art form can easily degenerate into, um, into a sort of faux naive tackiness. And, I mean, Hundred pounds of letter boxes. I just want to go along with the chainsaws, and apart from what you're like, and that sort of patchwork black and white quirkiness alongside the rectangular aluminium windows. I just, I just think hundred pounds. I would have, would have just been turning this grey, quite frankly. Um, and I think you see even now that teenagers and younger adults are conspicuously absent from that project. And I am really concerned that they are the people in the future. They are the rate players in the future who will be picking up that building when it's, when it's more tired and where that art has seen as a bit of a yawn to the past, I guess. Um, I mean, I could go on and I've, I, I ex <coughs> I've exorcised it constantly, actually, so I won't, I won't go on and on. But I do think that that project was a really, really demonstrated some really bad aspects of council decision making. I think it cost council a great deal, um, but the costs were hidden. Um, 
and I think it just took a long time for even a decision to come through around that project. Um, I was I was interested. Just I look back, and I I don't want to sort of go on and on, but I look back at the versus research which we called for in February 2014, which was versus are the company that does our community surveys, our staffs, um, our our customer surveys. And at that, in that survey, 36% pe of people were strongly opposed to the project and only 11% were in support. And I just remember the vilification that happened after that and the spin that was put on it. You know, we're only looking at people who had telephones, not mobile phones, and all these groups popped up to, um, to really challenge that, that information. And then I recall the um, meeting in June 14 where we actually threw out <laughs> throughout the um, Hundertwasser well, from the long-term plan. And then I recall that sort of Nick Minute, Nick Minute, um, <coughs> the project returned as a sort of new project because it didn't have council funding. And I always could never work out how that was a new project. Um, anyway, it's all life, it's all history. Um, I looked at, uh, because of my background, I looked a lot at the, um, the surveys that were done, like the Deloitte, which was actually what got me interested in council in the first place, um, where Deloitte said that they that the project would have to have 160,000 people visiting it, and then how that got turned into it, the project would have 160,000 people visiting it. I looked at the visitor solutions report, which said 220,000 people. I looked at the Crow Horth report, which said there'd be an economic impact of 26 million. And then I looked at the 15, 2015 Nexus report that was commissioned, which said that the um, the figures went sound. So I mean there's all this mixed feelings as each side tried to contend with um, the other side and, and the anger and the bitterness and the frustration and the unpleasantness that that all, all caused. So I just want to leave that to one side but I do want to talk a little bit about the building which is no longer there um, and which lots of people said was ugly, it was square, it was unattractive. The bit that had been added on at the, at, at the west side was just revolting. And I just want to refer to um, an assessment that was done of the building, actually in 2015, by H&K. Just bear with me, because I do like Art Deco too, sorry. And I mean, I completely understand that Hundabasa didn't like square buildings and wanted to um, put some round the corners, and, and, and I, I completely get that, but um, it's really about different architectural styles and respecting them. So the building, it says, was a product of its time. It exhibited the simplicity of the Spanish mission styling that had just started in New Zealand. At the time, the architect said, it is not beyond salvation, but good maintenance will last many years to come. It is not an architectural gem, nor is it an eyesore. But it is without a doubt one of the very few town basin buildings left of 90 plus years vintage that is able to tell a story about and played an important role in the formation of our city and our harbour. And I was reflecting on that just before when we talked about the Okara and, and the harbour and the development that's happened there, that the harbour board that we had at that time was hugely progressive, thinking about 20, 30, 50 years out for the city and what it did. We find that the Harbour Board building may well be worthy of a heritage classification, principally because of its association with the Harbour Board and the work that it carried out in the development of Whangarei City and the Harbour. We recommend that a full heritage assessment be undertaken, and until this work be done, this building be neither demolished nor substantially altered. It's further, further recommended that immediate repairs to the building be undertaken to make the building watertight in the interim. The building is a rare local example of post-World War I commercial architecture. And when you looked at the building, it actually referred to the nautical and the maritime themes that it had been built for. It's got, it had really art, a restrained Art Deco style, but it, had, um, it was designed to reference an ocean liner and there were porthole motifs. The stark, unaugmented appearance of the international style met with criticism at the time and is still criticised today by many, this is before it was demolished. But in 1922, it was uncompromisingly modern. Equally, the 1965 extension, 
with its carefully aligned, simple, undecorative form, was recognised with architectural accolades at the time. And it was called a glass wall, curtain glass wall building, and it was based on what they did at the Beehive. Um, and it was proposed because of its lightweight and it was influenced by the architecture of the day. I'll leave that there. I'll just say, regardless of one's view, the Harbour Board building was a vital part of Whangarei's art, culture and built heritage, and I think deserved to be respected. It is too late now because it has been expunged. And the tragedy in that for me was in the in the in the sense of develop in, sorry in the name of developing a sense of place which Paul Dill, who was our city planner at the time, kept going on and on and on about. The hundred guys have developed up uh, development obliterated the last remaining authentic building at the town basin. And now when you drive down Walton Street, it actually obliterates the view of Parihaka and things that I think we could be really celebrating as things that are authentic to us. So, what I hope from, from all of that is that Funday has learned. Learned not to take on a project that is so divisive, and I, and I still think, regardless of what side of the debate you were on, it probably would have been better if it hadn't happened, because I think it continues to be divisive. Learned not to take on undertake projects without genuine and coherent risk management assessments, and learn to get past what I call the magpie effect, where we go for bright, shiny, new ideas that will provide the answer to whatever problem there is. Right, that's that done. Now, <laughs> I've also, um, I found this sort of relatively interesting. It's really nice meeting these people, and I just want to pay tribute very quickly to everybody in the room, Greg, for his critically important process. process. <laughs> Nick, for, I don't know, just being Nick and what nots, I think what nots probably. Carol, for endorsing things. I just want to endorse this. Anna, for, I was just wondering <laughs> about the environment. Simon, Probably for his shorts, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, hey, not really short, not really for short. Phil for in 1968. <laughs> I've got it here. It was in the archives. Greg, yes, well, I was talking to my son-in-law the other day, and everybody agrees. <laughs> Ken for just being laid back and angular. Gavin for cops. Vince, just a question. I'm just curious for the hundred and seventeenth time. Shelley, for well, I always agree with her when she agrees with me. God, I hate it when she's on the other side, and that's straight back. And Jane. Sure, if this is a good question or not, but, but maybe it is. <laughs> and always just having a nice demeanour. And your worship, I do want to acknowledge, even though we have disagreements in particular in the Vasa, I think you've been an extremely, extremely able chair, a very, very fair chair. Um, I really want to acknowledge you as the Quarry Gardens people did today for that project, for when you were just a baby little council worker and the vision you and your late partner, ex-partner, the first, the other, the other one, <laughs> had for that, for that quarry. And I remember going to a meeting ages and ages ago about the quarry and, and you and Morton being there. And I just, I really want to pay tribute to, to, to your vision of that project. And I also want to acknowledge young Michael here. <laughs> and, you know, like I know he started counting down after this, 1,065 days and counting, but um, I'm sure he's been a, a really huge support and really yeah, for you. I just want to pay really quick tribute to, without going on to lots of people, to um, to the late Dennis, actually, because at the beginning of my council term, I sort of thought that you'd get, you know, you'd talk to other councillors, and so I kept ringing Shelley, and I and Dennis would always answer because Shelley was either out or not available. And I could almost hear Dennis going, it's that couple of you again. <laughs> but I do want to acknowledge Dennis and, and, and Shirley. 
I want to acknowledge also um, Rob Fulong, um, who I think came into council at a really critical time and really helped council after the Hundabasa issue to and help you, Your Worship, I think, to find our course. And I remember he sat for a year basically with his head down and just listened. And um, I, I think Rob played a really important role in getting this council where it is now. And of course, I mean, how can I, how can I, how can I sit down before acknowledging Caramel? <laughs> Just the stalwart, the, the backbone, the spine, possibly the stomach. <laughs> I won't carry on with the rest of the body, but uh, just the role she's played in terms of, for all of us, I think, sticking to process, being very clear about um, the importance of, of democracy in local government, and always being there to give us good advice and then occasionally beating me up as well. So, um, yeah, thank you. I won't go on about pension and housing, art and court, bus shelters, community development or fair trade, though Carolyn had suggested maybe art and court, but I won't. So thank you, thank you for listening. <laughs> Personally, I'm delighted that you stopped at Carol. I mean, the city rooms of staff. Um, your honest and forthright attitude, and in particular your strong social conscience, um, has been uh, a real breath of fresh air through the chamber. And uh, even today, um, you're raising matters in the uh, in um, You've grown to be a force to be reckoned with in chambers and uh, you're impressive and articulate in terms of your arguments and um, I, I suppose that first term is real challenging to have and, and I acknowledge that and, and that, that does home skills is also it also dates things from the term so I acknowledge that. Um, however you've always got a sense of humour and you always uh, chuck in a few humorous things right at the end of a pertinent uh, point we all raise a smile occasionally too, so thank you very much for that. Um, we also appreciate the stats that you send through <laughs> at all hours of the night, particularly if you're on civil defence duty and your phone's always on, and uh, another stat comes to us. Thank you for that. And um, you're always willing to have a hard conversation as well, you can do that in chains, so you argue those points really well. You're a strong advocate for community matters, housing, fair trade, uh, buildings, architecture, um, community groups, and cats. <laughs> Thank you very much for your Friendships and making new ones. 
having lived, worked, played sport, everything right through the district pretty much, it's been a fantastic opportunity to renew acquaintances with people that I've worked with along through the years. The multitude of community organisations I've been involved with have become my friends and I'll miss that association and I'm sure that some of them are actually watching this so thank you all. I especially want to acknowledge our staff, past and present, who have been nothing but generous with their help, professional expertise and companionship. And a word from the wise to new councillors, do not... What's that farm word? Greg? <laughs> That's the one. The staff. <laughs> They've been employed for their expertise, their professionalism and, as Anna said, their integrity. And a smart councillor wanting to achieve results figures out how best to add the multiplying factor to that expertise. As Vince said, do not piss them off. Ella. <laughs> 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 we worked together on a number of projects, not least the six years I spent as your Chair of Finance. My financial experience was quite limited. Compared with Alan's, it was like a drop in the ocean. So we agreed at the outset, or at least I agree, <laughs> that Alan would just make me look good. That was his job. <laughs> <laughs> He's remained stoically non-committal, um, but he has actually done a very good job of making me, Council, and your Worship look good. I have to say that the financial management under the direction of Alan has not only achieved the AA Standard & Poor's rating and continued to hold that, as we have just been, been advised, but the advocate in a recent article, even uh, his financial wizardry and our um, careful prudency Impressed even the taxpayers' union. So it's, yeah, which is serious stuff. <laughs> but it's also very hard for our critics to gainsay that. So well done, Madam Mayor, and our finance department. I don't think Delise is here, but she's certainly been a major contributor there. And thank you, Alan. I've really enjoyed working with you over all these terms. I also spent two terms as Chair of the Strategy Planning and Development Department, which has been fantastic since I've had Dom for a manager there. I've had quite a variety of managers in my various terms in the Planning Department. Um, Paul Dell, for example, who did fantastic work, but as Mark said at the time, you just clean the blood off the carpet after he's been through. <laughs> but he was a fantastic manager. Very good to work with. For someone who arrived in council barely knowing that there was a district plan, in fact, I don't know that I did know there was a district plan, it was somewhat of a sharp learning curve suddenly becoming the chair of the planning department. I thank the four mayors of my council terms for the faith they showed in providing me with the opportunity to step into hot water and extract myself out of it. I began this insane career 18 years ago with Pamela Peters as mayor. Pamela was more than generous with the roles that she gave a newbie, although I'm pretty sure a wiser councillor than me would have thought to see why it was I was falling into these roles that the more experienced councillors <laughs> were carefully avoiding. One of those, of course, was the Wangare Tourism Trust, which was pretty much a basket case at the time. And then the fairly shortly thereafter defunct was it Project Wangarei Trust? That was our economic development agency. And I became chair of the board of directors of that. And I remember Andrew Golightly at the time um, acknowledging my role by saying, congratulations, I think. I should have, yeah, I should have been a little bit wiser there, however. That gave me the opportunity to get into a lot of different places and meet a lot of people that otherwise I would never have had that experience. So, you know, I really do appreciate the opportunities that I've had along the way. 
My next mayor was Stan, followed by Morris, the yin and yang of Meralty. <laughs> I enjoyed both. Totally opposite extremes, but both were really good fun. Then came her worship. We battled for the role of mayor at the time when she returned to council, having first come into council together as a pair of newbies, which is where I got the expression possums in the headlights, which we pretty much were. <laughs> but I have to say, in worship, that that is a battle that I have never regretted losing. <laughs> <laughs> I think I actually lucked out and you got the hot seat and I've been very thankful to have not had it since you've done a remarkably good job in that hot seat. Three terms with Cheryl, enjoying and learning in the chair roles she entrusted to me, and enjoying our, term, our time as colleagues since we both arrived as newbies 18 years ago. My time as part of your support team, Your Worship, has been a valuable part of my life, as has the friendship we have grown into over the years. Council has provided me with fantastic opportunities. I've met lots of fabulous people, renewed old acquaintances, and worked with exceptional staff alongside great colleagues. And at this point, I also want to say thank you and acknowledge Simon for having shepherded me through a number of extremely difficult and um, deep <laughs> and muddy patches. So thank you for that, and that's the one thing I'm really sorry about not being here in the next term, is not being able to support you in your new role, and I just wish you all the best in it, and I will be thinking of you. As I sit in the sunshine, thinking of you. <laughs> and now I'm actually very glad to be quitting this room, and I just wish all you brave souls that are standing again the best of good wishes in the turmoil that seems to be to be racing down the tunnel. Good luck with it. That's the team. Six terms. What an outstanding achievement. Um, strategy Planning and Development Committee Chair, Previous Finance Committee Chair, Exemptions and Objections Subcommittee Chair, Chair Extraordinaire. <laughs> yeah. Um, throughout, you've always been really well considered, and when you talk to people, you listen to what they have to say, take that on board, and you always come back with what is very sensible. You're able to work with everyone, um, you're re related, and relatable to all, and you're, you seem to be able to manage to um, make your point, even if it's a point of difference, um, yet still maintain Good friendships. It's a real character trait that you have. Um, uh, you've willingly contributed hours and hours um, for your ward, for the community, for the district, and, uh, and for that, I really thank you. I think um, you've been very courageous as well. Sometimes you stand for positions that are very different from others, and you Standing, place your argument, and well done, and really appreciate that. But I think the, the one word that, that uh, stands out for myself, uh, and probably indeed a lot of people, is your pragmatic wisdom. And when you've um, stood up and given your point of view, I think most people go, hmm, that looks good. Mm. So you're very convincing, but it's that pragmatism. So after six terms, my word, um, you'll have all this time to go uh, and follow your own questions. Thank you very much for that. And you have a drink. <laughs> <laughs>
representing Whangarei Heads Ward. Of course, within the interest of the Whangarei District as a whole. Uh, it's, it's been a, a pleasure and a privilege. Uh, Whangarei Heads uh, is definitely uh, a ward with a particular character about it. Uh, and uh, it, it's been one that I, I think that you've heard a lot about Whangarei Heads over the last nine years. But uh, what I'd uh, really like to do is just uh, uh, say to Marin, uh, really appreciate it, uh, your support over this time. Uh, the phone rings constantly uh, and uh, a lot of the comments coming through at times are not the best, but on the other hand, there's some very good comments coming through. So I've really appreciated your support over the last uh, nine years. Really appreciated uh, staff and uh, particularly planning staff for the first two terms, uh, chairing planning and development. Uh, and I felt like I was part of the team in a way. Uh, I used to go down uh, to the staff, sit down and we'd chat things through and we would try and look at it, how we could actually progress planning. So, uh, and then as Deputy Mayor Elsa, I've really appreciated your support. It's been second to none, uh, dealing with those CRMs <laughs> from the Whangarei heads. And Cheryl, I really appreciated you giving me the opportunity to come in and chair a meeting, or a standing committee at first. Bit of a challenge, but uh, it was an enjoyable uh, challenge. And for councillors, I've come to realise that we are all representative of the community. And uh, once we're sworn in, uh, I always remember you, Councillor Martin, you said to me, well, you don't take anything outside the council chamber after we've had a discussion. And I thought, am I going to get knuckled over in there or what? <laughs> <laughs> do, I take, do I take this out? But, and and Councillor Holtz, I, you gave me a little sharp hit there one day when uh, I, I questioned what you were saying, and you said to me, are you calling me a liar, Councillor Ellis? <laughs> and, and I said, no, I just want some more information uh, on the subject. So uh, the debate's always interesting, it's always been intense, uh, but I think picking up on your point, Councillor um, or, or Greg, uh, is one that we just have to get over it afterwards and carry on. And I think Māori have taught me that uh, in terms of the marae, that you just don't take it outside the marae, you, you leave the discussion in the marae. Uh, it's been a, a privilege, and honour, which I've enjoyed for the most part. I've been hopeful to bring my skills and experience. Uh, ironically, I was brought into the council chamber because of cancer. Uh, and I was told that I had to take stress out of my life. <laughs> uh, so I had, had to stop travelling internationally and working. So I thought, oh, okay, well, I don't want to retire. I think I'll stand for council. <laughs> so it, I can say that there's been very little stress. <laughs> and, and, but uh, it's been thoroughly enjoyable. Uh, I just want to really discuss uh, in terms of Whangarei and its strong growth phase. It's been a real privilege really to um, be involved with the growth that we've had. Uh, and uh, when I look, and I, Karen, I know where the discussions that we had in terms of uh, the planning committee, I always saw that as a real privilege to chair that committee, but often people see, see it as sort of the hospital past because you're dealing with regulation. But uh, I think going through the plan changes, Don, you know, we, when we try to get a more incentivised approach into planning, I was hopeful that I could bring that le level of skill in, in, into um, uh, the council chamber and into those discussions. Uh, and I, particularly in terms of the urban and rural plan changes, I know it sounds a little bit tedious, but the reality was we got them through. And I think we got them through in a way that uh, provided um, more incentive. I used to hammer the stuff. We've got to get incentive in that. We can't just regulate. We've got to 
get incentive. And the placemaking, I think the placemaking has been great. Uh, the central, uh, the central uh, city plan, uh, I think, was the first start of that, and then the precinct plan. I think what they've done is really created what I consider a strong foundation for going forward. And I think now's quite a good break in terms of council because I know there's going to be a lot of change. Uh, and uh, it's a, a clean break point where I think the planning has really got to a stage that will hold us until the review of the RMA. You have to go through it all again. Uh, the co-governance partnership has also been something uh, 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 Phil, that uh, it's been good to work through that process. In the first term, I was able to have uh, Julian Chetnam uh, on the uh, standing committee, and now we have really come a long distance in terms of that partnership and really starting to get what I think are some very good results coming out of that. And for infrastructure, Greg, in terms of uh, looking at the loop, uh, looking at all the developments that have taken place there, so defining in terms of Fomeray. It really enables Fomeray to be a distinctive place of difference uh, to others. And I think if we can hold on to that, uh, we will actually achieve a lot. Uh, as a community, uh, as, as a, a city, as a district, and uh, uh, Trish, I think in terms of Hondabasa, yeah, there was debate. And uh, for me, I find uh, the Hondabasa has brought about a whole new, uh, I suppose, vitality uh, to the central city and bringing people in, into um, Fongaray. So uh, the other part I've enjoyed has actually has been down in Wellington, been part of the uh, governance and strategy um, uh, advisory role there. So uh, I've enjoyed that. So this speech is sort of one of two hearts. And uh, we've got some, I've got some photos put up there and I'll just, uh, so you can understand where I came from. So, uh, so you, you can see back in 1980, all right, uh, it's one woman. It's one woman. Yeah. Uh, Joyce Wright, who, who became a man. What, what, what I found really interesting in this role. Oh, I've got all of that too. <laughs> what, what I found really interesting in this role, I was 29 uh, when I was in this role. And there, there was a real form of idealism back in the 70s. And, uh, and the, the councillors uh, that were there were the mayors uh, and chairs of, of the <coughs> counties and boroughs uh, and the city. Uh, you can see uh, uh, Ted Elliott there, who I have a lot of respect for. But what I learned was that a lot of those councillors had been in the Second World War, and, and uh, particularly uh, on the left there you'll see uh, Colonel Ward, he was a colonel in the Long Range Desert Group, which is the SAS, and what I found was that they had a level of passion about them. They'd been to a war, they came back, and they wanted to have a big influence in terms of, of the uh, the region in my case, but the other aspect I found about them, they fought beside the 28 Battalion, Māori Battalion, and they had a real <coughs> respect for Māori. Uh, and what we found in those days, the legislation really didn't enable us to achieve what we wanted to achieve. Uh, so if we could just go on to the next one, which will probably create a bit of a laugh. Uh, so, uh, we, we occupied uh, the first floor on the uh, munici old municipal chambers there. And uh, you, on the, if you can, I'm the one in the middle. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> what, what, what I wanted to say was that it was an incredible culture that we developed 
uh, with uh, the governance and going forward. Uh, and it was one where about, uh, we really looked towards uh, trying to champion as much as possible uh, the new direction uh, that we could do under the, the current legislation. So uh, I've always appreciated being in charge of the organisation at that age, but it was for me to move on. Uh, and uh, I went on, I got involved with strategic planning and organisational change, cultural change, uh, initially in Wellington and Auckland after going back to University of Sydney and I spent a number of years uh, in the United States working but uh, at the same time I, I had contracts in the States, I also worked for Lao PDR which was a communist country and it was quite interesting to be working across uh, those boundaries. So uh, I was hopeful that I could bring the experience back into the chamber. I really miss the camaraderie that we have in here. It's something that uh, uh, I think that it's, you have to have served as a public servant uh, and then come back in a governance role to, to really understand and appreciate the role of staff and also uh, the relationship that we have within this chamber. We don't always see eye to eye, uh, but it's something that we're able to at least uh, walk out of uh, this chamber and uh, be able to uh, think that we are all on the same page uh, going forward. Uh, Cheryl, I really um, appreciate the leadership you've given. Uh, you're a friend, but also, uh, to me, a leader in terms of this role, in terms of governance. I've really appreciated it. I know that you're in for a real time of change. Uh, it's just around the corner um, and what's happening both economically but also in terms of local government reform. So uh, I wish you all the best, those standing, and uh, and just uh, can you look after Fonnery Heads? <laughs> <laughs> The new representative, but it cut him a bit of slack uh, to enable him to express his view without being called parochial. Thank you. That's <laughs> nice. Three terms, or yeah. as a blink of an eye, three terms have gone. Yeah. Um, commercial Property Committee Chair, previous Planning Development Committee Chair, Deputy Mayor. All things coordinated and uh, integrated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Phrase we often hear. Yeah. Um, your expertise as a uh, planning consultant, but also um, your time over in the states, you, you bring with it um, a wealth of uh, experience and expertise. And, uh, and we thank you for sharing that in the chamber and also outside the chamber. <coughs> Uh, helping us work through all manner of things, whether it be uh, change management, assistant programs. So, thank you very much for that. Uh, you made a huge and valuable contribution uh, to conversations on all matters of strategy and strategic issues, and um, you represent a wide range of interests. Um, uh, and you're very active in the community out in Bunbury Hanson. Um, we're always amazed with the ability to uh, link Whangarei heads to most issues. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's kind of well done, I didn't think you'd do it, but well done. <laughs> so, so we admire your passion for that area. Um, it's great to work through uh, ideas with you, you've been a uh, uh, source of inspiration. And, um, we look forward to seeing what you do in the future. And now I can tell by the photos that you have treated you well, too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
so bear with. <laughs> this is my last hurrah. 2013-2022. Firstly though, I want to acknowledge some people who have passed in the last nine years. Oops, wrong direction. Which was two mayors. A couple of pretty extraordinary people. And sadly, some staff members. And some personal losses with my darling friend Sandra and my brother Mungu. Moi Maira, Ngara Mutira, Emu. Emu. Oh, this is doing it by itself. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, you did like it, didn't you? <laughs> uh, but the scooter was my point of difference. It was uh, it was actually how I got around, and it became a bit of a, uh, a campaign point of difference. And nobody in this campaign has gone portrait with their with their billboards. You know, that dog, it works. <laughs> so uh, Diane Stoppard, bless her, she said to me when I first got elected, she said, quick, let's take a photograph, get that mural photograph, because before the ravages of the job, take a photograph. <laughs> <laughs> and my crikey, she was right, look at me, so young. <laughs> oh. You look exactly the same. Exactly, uh, yeah. <coughs> not on the inside. Uh, this was the first council. It was uh, a um, gender balance of seven, seven. We had seven men, seven um, women. Mix of experiences and newbies. I'm going to get really annoyed with this thing if it keeps going. How do I stop it? Um, and you'll note that uh, Mark Simpson was our chief executive then, and uh, yeah, it, it, was a, it was a pretty cool council. St the day after the um, election results, the Waitangi I now I can't move it. <laughs> right, the Waitangi tribunals, uh, the, the hearings were commencing in Whangarei and the tribunal was welcomed to Whangarei. <laughs> uh, you can see Judge Coxhead. Um, we practiced this, it was supposed to work. Sorry, Jenny, I'll, um, that's Judge Coxhead um, picking up the wheel and in a beautiful sort of full circle, um, he was also on the bench when we uh, uh, opened the new Māori Land Court just this month here in Whangarei. Um, apparently, it's still spoken about the fact that the Mayor, who had never been sworn in, um, attended that uh, welcome and I guess in a way it was the beginning of my absolute commitment uh, to Māori. I started a, what I called a crunchies list. I had a list of issues that were, that were coming up and I called it a crunchy list, not because they were <laughs> not because they are sweet, um, but because they were, they were crunchy. And actually, interestingly, I, um, Rob discovered my, my crunchies list and said, oh, can I have that? And he took a copy and started crossing them off. But uh, psychoactive substances, oh my word. Remember those? They were the absolute scourge of the, the city centre. It was they were horrid, horrid things. But we also had a couple of horrid things in the, in the way um, Queensland fruit flies who arrived and we shut, had to shut down. I learned a lot about MPI um, and, and what they do and how actually active they are in our community where they are. I see them going. Mm -hmm. um, on the right uh, there you can see the um, one of the Hikarangi floods in 2014 and uh, <laughs> Councillor Martin is chuckling because I went into his ute and I've got a photograph of the water coming over the top of the ute as we were driving <laughs> along. And um, Mark Simpson and, and Greg and I were in the car, and I was seriously thinking that we were go, just going to go blah, 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 <laughs> into the hickory because you couldn't see the road. But fortunately, we got where, where, where it was. Uh, acid sulfate soils. Oh my word! They talk about a um, sleepless nights, many, many sleepless nights over uh, that issue, and they, they now feature in various liberal talks and whatever. Can I? Can you take control of the next one? <laughs> <laughs> This was the ultimate crunchy of the first term, uh, the H bomb. 
And it was uh, it was through the campaign. It was actually are you for or against Kwanamasa? And I think my my phrase at the time was that together we would navigate uh, the, in, in finding resolution for the, the situation. Uh, but it sounds familiar, doesn't it? Are you for or against something? So as Trisha already um, noted, uh, thank you, Annette. The, um, the meeting of the 25th of June 2014. Look at the number of people we had in the council chamber. Those are members of the public. This is before we discovered that the maximum number of people in the house <laughs> in the chamber is 45. So uh, we, we've managed it uh, significantly. So that, that wasn't the only time that we had uh, people really interested in council processes, but that was the day that we voted 8-6 to remove the Hondasa from the, uh, the long-term plan. And uh, yes, <laughs> moving right along. We also, in that first term, managed to have some fun. Thank you, yes, next one. What am I going to do? It's working out. So for since uh, 2000 and uh, the year 2000, in fact, Whangarei has hosted uh, the International Rally of Whangarei or the New Zealand Rally of New Zealand um, when it couldn't be international thanks to COVID every year apart from uh, 2020, and that's a real uh, absolute highlight um, on the on the calendar. We also in that first term had the 50th uh, anniversary of uh, Whangarei becoming the city. And uh, so we had a grand parade through the streets, and I really want to do a big shout out to <coughs> Karina, who um, single-handedly organised the, the whole parade. She also decorated the floats, and she, she well, pulled together a team, but she was really, uh, kudos to, to her. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge, in, um, for the celebration of the 50th anniversary, we've been gifted um, the beautiful uh, Hoi Urangi in, uh, Urumi in front of me, Te Honga. Um, and it was carved about the, um, the it's, a, it's a steering rudder and beautiful symbolism in it and I really encourage you to get up close and personal with that um, beautiful bit. That, that was gifted to us because of 50 years of Whangarei becoming a city. Another project that we completed in that first term was the relocation um, of the War Memorial from Rowe Street uh, to Lorry Hall Park. And uh -huh, I will never forget that first Anzac um, morning. Sue Shepard took the most amazing photograph of it. But the, um, the, the, in the dark, and then as the sun slowly rose, and you know, I was in the privileged position of being up by the memorial and started looking around, and the faces the, of the people who came to commemorate Anzac Day that day was just amazing. I'm going to just thinking of it. Uh, I was really lucky to be the mayor when the uh, FIFA under 20 uh, teams were welcomed to Whangarei. We, we welcomed teams from USA, Uzbekistan, I love the fact we Uzbekistan, um, into, into that. Uh, and the other, uh, let me think, it was Myanmar. Uh, and actually, um, Dick Shepard's son was the um, trade. Ambassador. ambassador in Myanmar and he gave us an incredible amount of good um, guidance into how we would treat the team from Myanmar so we um, are very grateful to him for that. Uh, <coughs> there's a big but there, it was a landslide victory in, in the referendum. You'll see that the the, uh, the us Arts Centre actually got more than half of um, the, the votes out of the three, three projects. We did some other work. The Kohatu on Parihaka was, was unveiled. That's just a stunning piece of, uh, of history up on our place of lookout. Personal um, highlight for me was the beginning of Park Run. It started on the, uh, in, in uh, 2015, 2016. And of course our laneway, the canopy, was, was completed in that uh, same year, in 2016. So then came campaign number two, and I was the only person in the campaign who could have in their campaign slogan, you're mayor, because I was. <laughs> Keep it simple, stupid. But um, the, the, from 12 candidates the first time, there were only six in the second uh, campaign for, for the mayoralty. And um, in the third one, there were three, and I reckon if I'd stood with this time, there'd be none. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for that giggle. Um, in this uh, iteration of council, we had eight men and six women. And you'll see that Rob Fulon was our chief executive for, for this term of council. We got stuck into continuing to do some projects, project work that uh, 
with, and there's the start of the Carmel Share Path, turning the sod with the Prime Minister of the day, Simon Bridges. Uh, we did lots of intersection work and, and disrupted the whole district for a very long time, but we also uh, opened the in beautifully inspired name of the Pocket Park. We bought some land next door, uh, and at the time it was very clear that we said that it was for op future options. We thought we, it could be for a car park, it could be for a new theatre, it could be for one building, uh, but we knew that that was a very strategic piece of land and uh, it was, a, it was a, uh, the right thing to have done to purchase that. We also still had some more fun. We hosted the British and Irish Alliance versus the New Zealand Provincial Barbarians on the 3rd of June and um, if, if, for those of you who remember, it absolutely bucketed down in the days leading up to that game and uh, fortunately the sun shone when the, the game started and the drainage in the fields proved its worth. Uh, the photograph down on the left was the entire heart presentation a year, exactly a year prior to it. And I was um, thrilled to be able to be in a lineup of mayors who received the Taiha that were to be given to the um, winning team uh, in the game that was in, hosted in their in our respective districts and cities. Oh yes, there were more crunchies. Morning, Jane. <gasps> <laughs> Pesky and they proved really awful um, confrontational uh, to people in our district and they were they were a real problem but uh, we finally did they by clamping down working together with uh, police and community groups we, we managed to make them a thing of the past although I've seen I've seen them walk with for goodness sake. Uh, freedom camping was a bit of a, a, a challenge and somebody discovered they didn't um, have citizenship. <laughs> so that triggered a by-election and a lot of people. What a cool photo. Uh, it actually right. restored the gender balance for our council again too, um, back to 7-7. To seven, seven. Another uh, interesting process, we changed our logo. Mm -hmm. Absolutely beautiful. The Carmel Share Path, uh, back from that turning of the sod, we've opened stages one, two, three, four, and, and, um, and, and five is to come. And what a truly valuable asset that is to our community, uh, despite some of the events that are you know, not so good events that happen on it, but um, it, it will prove its worth as time goes on. This was also the term where we finally oh, see all the right roads. <laughs> Uh, they, the community there had started lobbying council back in 2014 and that final seal was completed on in February of, of 2019. <laughs> <laughs> in response to the mosque attacks in Christchurch on the 15th of March, um, we planted, the community organised the planting of 51 trees at Ōtuiho and um, somebody special in that photo, they went. Yeah, it's it's uh, that was a beautiful coming together of the community to acknowledge a tragic event in New Zealand's history. Oh. Yeah, say no more. I will, however, uh, note that the family who built that home at 15 Month Place were, were friends of ours uh, and they, um, we went with them to, to have a look at their home, which was had, had to be closed up. So it was pretty sad <coughs> for them and for the people who lived there at the time. But the last thing, the last crunch that happened in this term of council was the devastating harm. We talk about architecture. Um, I really, really hope that before we go on, we can get that awful plastic off that building and restore this beautiful building to its former glory. Um, interesting to note that, uh, that Greg and his had his photo taken on the, on the, the balcony. <laughs> but that was on the 10th of October and the election literally was um, you know, a couple of days later, so uh, it was pretty sad. The third campaign, as I said, um, three people vied for the mayoralty this time and I was blessed again to be elected Mayor to this council. <coughs> we haven't quite got the gender balance right again, it's gone back to 8-6 to with the, um, the, the men outnumbering women. Um, but we've managed to stick this one to the end, so uh, we've, we've, we've kept that. 
So that was October. In February of 2020, uh, the three mayors of Northland uh, got together and we said, we need to do something for our region. And we called together the Kiakaha campaign. And you'll see, uh, we, we said back the big five, that we wanted a world-class dry dock, the naval base to be relocated, the expansion of Northport, a four-lane expressway, oh, and a double-track rail, rail from Whangarei to Auckland. The dry dock is being worked on, the naval base watched this space, Northport are absolutely in, um, and all credit to them, they are doing the expansion. We keep banging on about how important uh, Transport, road transport infrastructure is to our region, and the work was done on the improvements to the, the rail line with the bridges uh, strengthened and widened, and uh, the, the track is, is better than it was, but it's nowhere near a double track electric railway from Whangarei to, to Auckland. But you never know, um, Kia Kaha Northland, uh, those benefits may come in the future. But of course, the ultimate crunching in turn three. That has been an incredible disruptor to this term of council and for the, the councillors who have only served on this term, um, I don't think you've got any appreciation of the <coughs> impact it had on the, our ability to form a really good team. Because we had to work from home. And you'll see Skype for Business was the, uh, the first platform that we went on uh, in the 30, on the 30th of April 2020 and Alan kept on telling us Skype, we had to use Skype, we couldn't use Zoom, we couldn't use Teams, so Skype for Business and it was, it was pretty darn awful. Uh, however, we did get the, um, the business done. The weather gods um, forgot that it was COVID and dumped some rain on us on the 17th of July, it was an incredible weather bomb. And we had to deal with the, uh, the absolutely ghastly environmental mess of the sustainable insolvents cleanup. And kudos to the team who have managed to do that. After lots and lots of toing and froing and rounding about him, we decided that we would put <laughs> the one building on the RSA side. I did warn Alan that he was going to be in my building. My you know, uh, we signed the contract to construct the Civic Centre, as it's now known, only uh, in September 2020. It's just two short years ago, and we had COVID in between, so pretty impressive, the, uh, the ramifications of COVID. We've also done some um, forward thinking, um, you know, for, again, for, for Newcastle. This has been a long, long project, the Airport Relocation Study. And we still haven't made the decision, but we have looked to the future and we've bought, we bought one. And you'll be pleased to know that uh, it's providing a nice healthy return to our, our ratepayers as a farm. That question was asked at the campaign meeting the other night. We also, something I'm incredibly proud of, uh, we voted to introduce Māori Awards to the 2022 and 2025 elections. It triggered a representation review, and again, there's a um, mixed reaction to uh, that process. However, the, um, I have to pay tribute to the calibre of the Māori Award candidates who are standing in this election. Oh my goodness, we could make a full council just of them. We also, uh, long term projects, we opened the Fogale Water Treatment Plant in July last year a $31 million project, and we've got an additional funding to be able to complete some of the things that we had to trim off the project when we first, but again, this was a, a something that we chose not to upgrade the water treatment plant uh, at, where, at the existing one, we chose a new site, and after quite a bit of negotiation, we, we got around to investing in that for the benefit of future generations. In October of the same year, we had a pretty awful campaign, actually, I have to say. Um, it was, it uh, was disparaging of the work that councils do. The uh, government will deny that they said it was um, uh, a, a slight on councils, but we had a different opinion. And again, it's hard to believe that that's less than 12 months ago, and um, we've been fighting for less than a year. It feels much, much longer. Uh, and I just want to also acknowledge that from a personal perspective, 
the future for the management for waters is in a co-governed, co-managed space. And I think that's the, the future. We've got the regulator in place, let's do it. Uh, controversial projects, of course we have one. <laughs> on again, off again, hopefully on again. We've done years and years of, of transport upgrades, and these are kind of intersections, but there have been many, many seal extensions and just general maintenance of the transport network within our district over the many, many, more than nine years, many years. We've also invested in some cool new playgrounds, and skate parks, and uh, things that people can access without having to, to, to pay anything. They're, they're there for our people and for, for visitors as well. Now, potholes. <laughs> I, I knew I had to include potholes. You know, I googled Whangarei potholes and I came up with screens and screens of potholes all over the country. We're not the, the best at producing potholes. We've got many districts who say, we've got the worst potholes in the country. We've got the worst. They are a problem. They really are, and uh, yeah, say no more. There have been just massive investment into subdivisions and new homes and all over our district, and some of them controversial. But I can't remember the, the number of, uh, did I write it down? How many uh, lots? More than 3,000. 3, it's probably way more than 3,000, but that's where I kind of get to. 3,000 lots created just in the last nine years, and many of those have been built on. The next few slides Mike said to me, please don't. No, I have to, because we've worked really hard on long-term plans, annual plans, yeah. <laughs> city centre plan and the, yeah. um, the precinct plan, city core and the waterfront pre precinct plan. We've done placemaking, we've done the dual of the city report, reports, we've had strategies for arts, culture, heritage, active recreation and sport, walking and cycling, sustainability. Sustainable Futures, that was our growth strategy, the Te Tai, te tai Tokoro Climate Adaptation Strategy, Whangarei 2020 Momentum, and that famous Blue Green Network Strategy. In my time as Mayor, I have had the privilege of meeting with MPs, with uh, treasured locals, special, special people, in tangata, he tangata. What a lucky girl of my being. Look at this, the, um, Laura Clark from the British High Commissioner. This is Cindy Kiro before she was our Governor General with former Prime Minister Helen Clark. Judges, people. But truly nothing beats the locals. <laughs> and I have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of selfies <laughs> that I've taken over the years that um, bring great joy. Now I would like to pay tribute to the elected members who I've, I've been privileged to serve with. Now when, I, when you look at one term, this is the one term that I've served with, there's not their term, number of terms. So Frank, Anne, Robin and Pamela, <coughs> Warwick, Stan and Fesky. Simon, Ken, Carol, and Nick. One in the bit. <laughs> <laughs> Jane, Kathy. I served two terms with Kahu, Merv, and Brian. Three terms, oh, sorry, two terms with Cherry, John, Stu, and Anna. Three terms with Vince, Greg, and Sharon. Four terms with Sue and Crichton, and five terms of these three ah. rows. <laughs> so Shelley, Greg and I were newbies in Pamela's Council in 2004, and look at us now, we were still here. Phil, on the other hand, was not a newbie at that council, but he was an incredible, I've often spoken of, uh, I had, I was, Pamela placed me between Phil and Frank Newman. <laughs> no, I tell a lie. Phil and Robin Leifering. Oh. I tell a lie. And so I had Robin and, and Phil either side of me giving me guidance as a new councillor. And I used that tact 
um, technique in the num numerous times that I've moved <laughs> councillors around. Um, but yes, the, the bombs that were lobbed between Frank yeah. and um, Robert, <laughs> we managed to survive. <laughs> I've had the privilege of working with three chief executives, the longest of course uh, being Rob for seven of my nine years and um, nicely bookmarked by, by Mark and, and Simon and I pick up on the point of caution you all the very, very best as you proceed into uh, the next council. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, the, the, it was noted that that um, sort of partnership of uh, Rob, Rob as my CE as our CE and, um, and, and me as the mayor that um, we we really changed the face of this district. Mm -hmm. These are the people, and I couldn't get them all in, of course. These are the people who actually do the mahi, and I can't thank them enough because they really do have to put up with an awful amount of rubbish and garbage and things that come, that come around the chamber occasionally. But also we make some fine decisions that our people are proud to implement. So kudos to them. That was um, a, a time when we went up to the Whangarei Primary School on the Civil Defence evacuation. Um, so there's a few faces that you can see in there, some of whom are still here. My last few slides are very personal to me. My deputy. Sharon, um, I, I served uh, in my term with Stan Semenoff, uh, and we formed a very firm foundation for a friendship that endures to the, this day. She and I have seen some really awful things. But we've seen some incredible things as well. So thank you, my friend. My whanau. Uh, that's Princess Maya up on the right hand side. <laughs> um, self proclaimed, of course. Uh, but yeah, in, uh, in the middle up at the top there is my grand our granddaughter Charlotte, who is studying at uh, Canterbury University for engineering, and she just told us the other day that she's going to go into civil engineering. Oh. <laughs> Granny Cheryl has been the mayor of Whangarei for half of her life, and um, I think she's going to be a bit disappointed when she can no longer sort of um, have the kudos of saying, that's my friend. <laughs> um, my little moko. Um, my nephew's children, Isabella and Declan, there are others, but um, they took great delight in having a photograph with, with um, great aunt Cheryl. Precious, precious, precious little twins. Uh, uh, my sister, my brother-in-law in the middle, and who's, oh, and of course, um, I want to acknowledge my stepchildren, um, both Shannon and Manu, but also my stepdaughter, Rachel, Mother of my granddaughter. Um, very, pre and all my cousins, you know, uh, bask in the delight of saying that they've got a cousin who's a mayor of Whangarei. My precious aunt rang yesterday and um, blessed her. It's her birthday today, and I told her it's my last um, meeting, and I said I'd be thinking of her, so Auntie Jess, this is for you. She's not in the room, but um, my best Luke buddy, my, my buddy Jane, um, we have solved the problems of the world many times over. Um, in my diary, I still to this day have walkies with Jane and Lulu at 7am. Uh, Lulu was a dog who died some time ago, but we loved it a bit, so she still stays in my diary, so we think of her every day. And um, to Jane, uh, you know how much I've leaned on you, and um, you're my confidant, my mentor, a critic, and friend, thank you. She's unwell, so um, it's a shame that she can't be here. <laughs> We are not twins. <laughs> She's much older than me. <laughs> but as we grow older and more alike uh, and closer and closer, uh, I'm seriously looking forward to having some time with this precious person to me. Those, um, those photos were taken um, at the opening of Te Kākano, 
um, the colour our city in uh, June 2017, um, a pre-campaign photo where, bless her, she bought a, uh, an outfit to match. <laughs> and um, at uh, my brother-in-law Dave's mother's 99th birthday, um, I cropped Doreen out because it didn't seem appropriate, but she's in there. <laughs> Thank you to my family. There are two people left, and you, it will come as no surprise that they are my work PA and my home PA. <laughs> <laughs> and I seriously could not have done this job without them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Finally, and it is seriously final, almost final, penultimate final. Uh, three times, I, Cheryl Lorraine Mine, declared that I would faithfully and impartially, and according to the best of my skill and judgment, execute and perform in the best interests of Whanganei District, the powers, authorities and duties vested in, or imposed upon me as Mayor if, of the Whangarei District Council by virtue of the Local Government Act 2002, the Local Government Official Information and Meetings Act 1987, or any other act. I do believe I have honoured those oaths. Finally, I have a gift for the council and it's tucked under my chair. It was suggested that I say to everybody like Oprah does, check under your chair. <laughs> but I'm the only one that won. So I had to think about who I would present this gift to. <coughs> because we don't know who the next mayor will be. But I am hoping that whoever it is will take pleasure in cutting the ribbon on the new Civic Centre oh. <laughs> with scissors presented by me to Whanganei. It just says presented by Cheryl Mayer 2013 to 2022. This is in a beautiful piece of wood that was crafted by my stepson Manu and I thank him for that, for his gift to us as well. So I'm going to give them to Simon in safekeeping to present. <laughs>
local government reform, three waters, challenging projects, just to name a few things. Your vibrancy and uh, political astuteness has um, provided you with great ability to lead this council and previous councils. Your ties to the community are diverse and they're deep and across many different facts. Arts, sports, education, service organisations, your natural ability to connect to people times three. We've seen huge progress across the district since 2013. The loop has become our pride and joy. Um, we celebrate iconic infrastructure being built around the place. We've seen photos of some. We've got paths all over the place where people can just scooter on. <laughs> and um, we're watching with interest as Hawaii Island develops into a um, vision that is crafted. Um, we've seen our city work towards becoming a more sustainable um, city following the adoption of the sustainability strategy and the declaration of climate emergency. And more recently, we've taken our first foray into co governance through the climate change adaptation to uh, Takara and the establishment of our housing strategy co governance subcommittee. Um, we have worked towards enabling more Maori participation in decision making, and that sets the ground for this council. Uh, we've hosted the British Lion Tour under 19s and seen our city come to life with major global events. And closer to home, um, we've had Matariki days, uh, festival and Christmas festivals, and all of that has been, uh, been great and adds a richness to us. On a personal note, um, I thank you for all the support you've given me, for uh, all the challenges and um, that you put forward, but most of all, um, for being you, being very straight and honest and very fair. So, thank you for all your leadership over the years.
Aifakamiki kino na yakoe, akita toko fa anu kaputa atona wa, engali kia tai mai tamanga kitera na na kita ma kino na ita kami ka ho. Nore te na koe, akita toko fa ai ka wehe atona wa, te na kuta, te na kuta, rata te kuma ma te kia rata, tata te ma koe tanga iho, huri te huri noa, te na kuta, te na kuta ko tata te ne tihe mai noa. Unite and bind the hearts of all to a commitment of unity 
the standing life force, the alert life force, the balanced life force, sneeze, the breath of life. Thank you very much.